From beyond the farthest reaches of our galaxy they come. Two brains pulsing with a strange energy. These space brains come to share their love of science fiction movies. Welcome to Space Brains, the show where we joy watch sci-fi movies and then talk about what was good and what was great. I'm sorry, and this is Mark. Hiya! It's a classic! It's episode 65! We're Woo! talking about the absolute classic Surrey Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And this is the 1956 version, the original of this kind of series. There's been many, many remakes. I think, in fact... After we after I watched this, I looked it up. There's a new one coming. There's a brand new one yeah, coming. I saw that so one. it just kind of gets made time and time again. And also it is uh it's influenced so much other sci fi and we'll get into uh, that later. Episodes of T V shows as well. Yeah. Uh, so much. So many movies and books and yeah. yeah, it just goes on. It's huge. So in this episode tonight we'll reveal what we thought about uh, invasion of the Body Snatchers, the ins and outs of narrative and some film language, plus a deep dive into a specific piece of science that the filmmakers are proposing. Now, this original Invasion of the Body Snatchers was directed by Don Siegel, classic Hollywood, 1950s, 1960s, probably a bit in the 40s, Hollywood filmmaker, yeah, made 70s. many, many films. Yeah, and he just went and went and went. His Clint Eastwood stuff in the, the <laughs> 70s, great. Um, it was written by Daniel Mainwaring, who wrote the screenplay. That was based on Jack Finney's magazine serial. Uh, and the great thing for Jack and his family is they're going to be being paid again when they make this remake coming out this year. Because <laughs> that's the way it works in America with those royalties. They just, the writers keep cashing in, you know, it never ends. Uh, and now on IMDb, they also mentioned that Richard Collins, who has written some other things, also was an uncredited writer for this. So I'm not sure what that was, but I want to mention that, yeah, he is and, part of this version. And don't forget the additional dialogue by the Wachowskis. <laughs> no, hang on. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah, so so that, that, that sort of sets up the film. Yes, yeah, so turn back now if you haven't seen the film. Oh, yeah, this is well, your you've, warning. You've probably seen a version of this film. You probably But have. go back, watch it. You can... Uh, I rented it off one of the movie rental online Yeah, me too, ones, me too, yep. Popular ones, uh, and yep. it was fantastic. And yeah, it was. And then join back in and listen to us yarp on about it. Yeah, give give the Don Siegel family a couple of dollars in those rental through the streamers. Uh, this Invasion of the Body Snatchers, as the title suggests, what more do we need to know? But basically this one is about a small town doctor learns that the population of his community is being replaced by emotionless alien duplicates. So what was your number one takeaway from Invasion of the Body Snatchers? Sorry. There's an actual accent in America that talks like this. <laughs> Hi, yes, I've been taken by the Body Snatchers. That's the 1950s talk, isn't it? Yeah, I, I have I have not. Maybe some <laughs> of them, someone from the United States could probably let me know what accent that is, but it fascinates yeah. me. Let's talk. In Australia, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. We, well, well, in Australia, we are really only have uh, two accents. We, we That's sort of, not true, mate. That's not true at all. We've sort of got the two accents. We've got the, the ochre, yeah. uh, which, is, which is the one that the international people try to imitate but fail. They do. And then there's the, uh, would we be called what, received pronunciation, which is yeah. like, I guess... More what ma, ma, much of the rest of Australia speaks. Who yeah. aren't I will Oka. say you're from another state or territory originally. You know, you've been in WA for a long time. But I will say when I travelled through Queensland as a 17-year-old, once you head up right north of Queensland, they kind of talk pretty weird. They right, talk yeah. a lot weirder than what you think in WA. Like I was very, whereas I've been over WA, like I've been right up to Broome, et cetera. And they, they're kind of, it's pretty similar like once you're in outback WA. But yeah, up, up the, that, that northern tip of Queensland, because we went right the way up as a family, they do talk a little bit odd. 
I will yeah, say. Well, like I always, I, was... I agreed. I always thought it was kind of like Bogan Aussie versus Aussie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the people I kind of sort of knew, and I actually thought I was a bit of a Bogan anyway, but realised no, I'm not an actual Bogan. But then it's like I went over to Queens. I'm like, they talk a bit weird here. They and they have different expressions especially oh, to us there are sand gropers there are different different <laughs> expressions about the place the victorians but, uh, like to say grouse for example well sorry i'm a bit Sydney disappointed is that is, are you telling me that's what you took away from this movie that's your number one takeaway is the I, cu- I couldn't get over that guy <laughs> what was his name ted or alan or whatever his name was al the main guy no 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 his 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 buddy who cut his hand. Oh, the, uh, the rider the rider <laughs> the rider <laughs> the rider yeah who talk like this Yes, it was just... This body fun. has just turned up in my house. <laughs> there was no explanation. <laughs> no. What, you found a corpse? And you just ring the doctor. Fair enough. And, okay. then, and then you and the doctor decide, no, let's not call the cops. And that's even what the cop says to me. He goes, and you didn't decide to call us? You know, like, why didn't you report this? Uh, well, they're having fun. Yeah, yeah, they were. So, yeah, that's a good number one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting distracted. Uh, okay. So was it Hope warning... Warning, warning, warning. So we gave you the warning to go back and watch the film before listening to us. But this film is a theme of warning. So a warning is a story which is a cautionary tale. To me, it's really spelt out just even with the opening of this film with the doctor being crazy, like he's just come out of the experience. like, And the people, like he's kind of like ranting and raving and very hysterical and uh, which is very normal in 1940s, 50s films. People get quite hysterical. But he's he's doing that and everyone is like, yeah, this guy's crazy. Like his story is crazy. And to me, it's like a warning that if, this, if, if an alien race really wanted to take over us, this is probably the best way to do it because humans, we do really doubt crazy humans, don't we? Oh, if people start acting... It's not even crazy people. It's- no, it's just... We like a weird sense, isn't it? You Next know? time you're out walking around and you see a like a, a bunch of unsupervised teenagers. Oh yeah, I warn my kids. I'm like, oh, there's a group of teenagers. The thing is, I, I was I was watching people walk past. It's it just these teenagers. They were just kind of hanging around. Yeah, people warning, walking warning. past. So teenagers, and, and you see a lot of people sort of giving them, you know, sort of dirty looks or were huddling away. There was definite suspicion mm. or concern. A lot of other people also just sort of walked past and went, uh probably who had teenagers of their own but <laughs> or remembered being I, I was looking at it and i thought to myself why is it because yeah this is what i do i i wonder why mm. why is it that um we have this feeling because i had it too i was looking at them and there was inside this little bias this little word going oh hey that's mm, mm. not sure about this and the reason i figured is because teenagers are starting to look like adults mm. like at, at a first glance you might confuse them for yeah adults. you could you could but they're still, you know, Children. they're only just becoming independent. They're not yeah. living in an adult world yet. They haven't been taken over by the, They haven't become pod they people. Haven't, they haven't been body snatched by no. the adulthood completely. And so the problem is you get this conflict where you're seeing people who should be adults and should be acting like adults, mm. but they're acting like children. It's unpredictable. It's, yeah. it's not what you're expecting. And it's, it's frightening. Yeah. And so you get these stories here where people get replaced mm. and they don't behave the way you expect yes or in this case you know like you know the acting crazy as it were yeah. we're afraid if someone is like um you know next time you're walking along and you see someone suddenly singing and dancing in the middle of the street yeah the first reaction people have is not one of oh yay chapping and clapping and yeah. cheering unless it's an obvious performance they'll, they'll step back and, and look around and going what's mm. what's happening you know how should i feel about this yeah this is unusual so yeah it's this um crazy is is very it doesn't take much in fact dr miles says it in the movie here yeah yeah it takes actually quite a lot to become genuinely crazy yeah. <laughs> there's a lot lead up to that yeah and he do, he does explain that and we, we can get into a bit of the plot, plot points but it, it is interesting isn't it? it's like so you know the star of this film our main character is crazy and then we flash back the couple of weeks or days or whatever it is to them when he came back and he noticed things and see, that's what he says. And that, that to me also makes this film like it very much spells out very quickly that theme because Dr. Miles, our main character, once people start saying to him, oh, look, you had, you know, like uh, people have been coming to your doctor's surgery wanting to see you one day and then now they're not coming back again. They're, they're fine suddenly. And then also like, and then he gets told, 
um, Uncle Ira has been acting weird, but he, he he's exactly Ira, but he's he's just not Ira. He's not looking at me the right way. Like yeah. like it, there's no. It's very easy if someone says like you're sick and you're sneezing and you're coughing and you're sweating and you've got a high temperature. Like it's obvious there's something wrong with you, but. If someone's looking at you going, he's not looking at me the way that he normally looks at me. Like, you can't scientifically kind of put that. So then, therefore, when people tell you those stories, you start to go, yeah, you know. And likewise, you know, if you see any of these strange encounters of the third kind. <laughs> but, you know, like someone says, oh, I was driving late at night on my own down a dark highway. And all of a sudden, two red eyes were on the highway and I slammed on the brakes and I looked down the highway and this creature elongated itself and then it kind of roared at me and then ran into the woods and you're like okay did you go and we, we even went after it and we kind of drove off the road and we we looked for it i looked for it and you were by yourself yeah i was totally by myself and it was really like yeah it was like 2 a.m i'd been driving for 14 hours yeah okay you probably saw you know it's hard to believe those stories isn't it very so hard. and that's what this film is kind of like it's like very quickly it's spelt out that this idea of like, hey, I know Surrey quite well. He's just acting a bit weird today. But then could you imagine me saying to everyone, look, this, this isn't Surrey. This is not Surrey. And Surrey's like, it's me. I, I don't know what's wrong with Mark. Of Someone's wrong with Mark. Of course it is yeah. me. <laughs> That's right. Who do so you expect? Ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, when this podcast is broadcast across the universe, Surrey, uh, by NASA, um, for looking for intelligent listeners... Uh, <laughs> the uh, the aliens that pick up. <laughs> this is the fail. way to overtake the human race is to literally make us just doubt each other, right? Like doubt. <laughs> anyway, I think it's a major cautionary state um, statement. What was your first impression of this film? My first impression is um, I really liked the... Uh, I, I sort of got the feeling of police detective noir. Like We're talking about yep. a dark city. Yep. Yeah. And we had this similar thing. We had like the, a voiceover mm. giving us, you know, uh, I thought everything was normal and mm. it all seemed fine. And, you know, but it wasn't strongly detective style. Yeah. Uh, I, I also really liked the 50s aesthetic. Mm. They managed to get it very authentic. In they this. did. It looked like the 1950s. <laughs> but it, it, it was nice. It was made you know, in it was, 1956. It's, it was a nice slice. And I really looked forward to seeing... The way you know police were portrayed, the way yeah. doctors are portrayed, the way everything happens in the timeline, as well as these watching police the story. These police officers just pulled their gun out, even through a window. Hey, boys, what you doing? <laughs> <laughs> he's just he's just got the gun out on them, you know, straight away. But it it was no uh, and and so my first impression was um, is this nice sort of mystery. Uh, I was walking into this world I haven't seen much of. You know, yeah, you're, you're watching. Yeah, Metropolis. Yeah, 1920s, but you don't really know how much of that is the 1920s and how Correct. much is yeah, what yeah. they imagine the future to be. Yeah, yeah. This was but just 1950s. This was 1956 yep. set in 1956. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from a book written in 1955. Yep. So it was a very genuine. It was it was really right on the money. Mm. They weren't. Uh, it wasn't Stranger Things going for the nostalgia look. They were going for a contemporary look. Yeah, definitely. And so I was getting that from it. But yeah, cool. I also liked the way that the film, uh, it had that horror film vibe, but yeah. also uh, the mystery. Mm. It developed this nice mystery going along. Of course, knowing it's called the Invasion of the Body Snatchers, <laughs> knowing its reputation, mm. I sort of knew about that. But it was still interesting to see how is this going to develop? How are we going to be yeah. introduced to these things? And I was genuinely pleased. Yep. Yes, and I also wondered what it would look like in color. And uh, yourself, where did you watch this? How did you how did you go about getting a hold of it? Uh, same, same sort of thing as you. I've got one of those little boxes that does connect to a bunch of apps, and one of them you could rent this off. So, which was awesome, as I sort of joked about earlier. Yeah, a couple of dollars. I, I love that we're in this. Isn't it such a like amazing technology that a lot of those old films you can just they might be available on the streaming anyway, but at the same time, you can just get so easy access to it. I went to, I, I did film school and we had to like, you'd have to go to Planet Video, the only video shop in Mount Lawley, which doesn't exist anymore now. But, you know, like in the whole of Perth, it was the only one that had those weird, extreme, you know, 1940s, 1950s old films or <laughs> something like that. So mm. we're in a great a age that you can just kind of like request a film like that for a couple of bucks and... Yeah, just watch and it on your big screen. As much as people complain about piracy, 
piracy has actually done its part to preserve old and yeah, cult films. Like that's right. There, there have been films which have never not been rescreened. Yeah. Um, parts of uh, the TV series The Goodies mm. were recovered from people sharing. Yeah, there you go. Tape recordings because yeah. the BBC had a big fire which burnt their archives. Same with Doctor Who. Yeah. People recorded Doctor Who and were trading tapes around Doctor Who, and then the BBC at one point said, "Like, hey." Can we get some of those back? We'd like, we'd like to actually <laughs> yeah, regain we want copies, our culture. Yeah. And so now you can get the largely restored full yeah, collection yeah. of Doctor Who thanks to um, this distributed network of people yeah. sharing. I, I can't remember exactly the story, but I, I, that in Hollywood, like a lot of the big studios, you know, I'm talking Universal and Warner Brothers and stuff, there was some point like in about 1980s that they just kind of were tossing the films away. Like, yeah. you know, the, the, and I'm talking like the, the, they, cause they had no value. Like in their mind, there was no value because everything was becoming like VHS and TV screenings and all this sort of stuff. So they just sort of thought, why are we archiving like something from the 40s or the 50s or whatever? And they literally just started discarding these films. Mm. And then, it, then it, it, the irony was that you get to about the middle of the 90s and it goes the other way where they're like, no, we need to keep everything. <laughs> And they like kept, and then like there was, I remember reading that there's archives of, you know, all these, you know, like if you take Warner Brothers, like every single cut of the film, whatever it is, you know, in the nineties, they've like kept every single role of film, you know? And, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a bizarre thing, isn't it? That they just sort of flipped like that, but yeah, there's no value in a lot of old stuff. So, and I know the TV networks, even locally channel seven, for example, a lot of the stuff they shot in the seventies, eighties, like those things just went in the bin. Like they just like lit, at some point they threw tapes in the bin and like you said maybe something like the goodies it's like hey does anyone actually have any old episodes we yeah. should archive that <laughs> yeah well we can resell that or yeah, that's right it's it's value in that did you have a favorite scene uh yes i really love the greenhouse scene with the oh, pods yeah. popped open me too that sound was like <laughs> yeah. a little pop and the, and the and these kind of rubbery formless things and they were really good because they weren't they didn't just put mannequins in there. They were mm. like these, they were weird, just kind of, uh, almost like they, they kind of had a head like shape and mm. kind of shouldery type bits and little curly, but they weren't. It they was were, cool how they, they revealed just, it. Hey, like, cause it kind of, you're right. Like the, the pod spilt open. It was, it was quite organic. Like it was like juices flowed, flowed out. And, and again, because this is 40 years before CGI, it's got to be done all manually. So it's a little bit like these weird sort of, things were coming out and they're automatically expanding. I don't know if you've ever done a thing with your kids, like those things that you put in like water and they just expand yeah. like an egg and, or an egg and it cracks open over two days and, and it just, be, pops yeah, out. yeah. And the dinosaur pops out. It's just this rubbery plastic thing. But if you leave it there, it kind of keeps growing. And that's what was sort of happening here. Something kind of was splurging out. And I really, I really watched that myself and was kind of smiling because it was like, they, you could see they used bubbles and they yeah, the used bubbles and the smoke. They, they and sort the... of used, um, yeah, like a bit of trickery in terms of, you know, like these weird stretchy things came out to begin with and it was a bit plant life. And then when the actor kind of looked again, you, they've just progressed it. So now it's like a little bit of a face or yeah, head I, or something. I, and, I just loved it because they were there yeah, having their too. barbecue and it, and it really brought the horror of this yeah. body snatching because yeah, yeah. it's one thing you go to someone's house and there are people there that aren't the people. Yes, you, that's, yeah. that's a bit creepy. That's, that is scary. But this is it. They, they come back and they were having a bit of a barbecue. They, were, mm. they kind of weren't that concerned about the situation no. at that point. That was kind of that tipping point. It was, yeah. Where then he looks and he's, he's going to get his lighter fluid, I think it was, mm. and sees... That's an interesting little contrivance to get in there, isn't it? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. But, and then he sees these pods and they're like popping open and suddenly it's, it's grotesque and it's yeah. in your face and it's like, hold on, there's these things are going to be us. Yeah, yeah. They're going to slowly turn into us. And yeah. we don't, we didn't know at that point what it was to, you know, what happened to the original. Mm. We still don't know no. what really happens. No, the film situation. doesn't explain that, does it? But it's, yeah, like, so that, that was like the real horror reveal of the monster of this film if you like was yeah definitely not just that there are people who are, look exactly like us but aren't us yes but there's just this this process was clearly alien it was gooey it was it was gross um and yeah. that egg thing is 
a little bit like the alien egg, isn't it? Like there was a connotation there a bit, you know, like, I mean, obviously it's the other way around as in alien connotating maybe this, but it was that kind of cabbage popping open, you yeah. know, that we've seen in Alien and in Alien it kind of like folds back to the fore where then the face hugger kind of like launches itself. So it wasn't quite the same as that, but it was a very reminiscent pod cabbage shape that originally kind of spilled over and popped I, I think there must yeah. be something so there is a connection there that fears like eggs a, like a pod <laughs> yeah like because it, it's it's common in a lot of horror films yeah. to have some sort of cocoon or a chrysalis or a pod or a spaceship or something sitting there and then spill open cracks i mean the blob the version of the blob i saw which was i uh, would have been in the 80s or yeah probably an 80s mid 80s version it was a, an, a meteorite had landed, hit the ground. Mm, mm. And the person goes to investigate and it cracked mm, like a, like a yeah. pod and then the goop. So maybe that's up. a primal hunter-gatherer thing that we don't, you know, like it's inside us. Like sometimes you look at those eggs and it's like, we don't really know. And it could be berries on a tree, right? Like it doesn't have to And you're like, If you eat that, you might die. Yeah, like well, we don't know. Like that might kill you. So don't eat it unless we've got like the scientific proof that it's okay. <laughs> but I thought there was a good connection. So why is this film a sci-fi, sorry? But a sci-fi? Yeah, uh, like what makes Invasion of the Body Snatchers well, a sci-fi? Well, again, we're, we're looking at a science... Uh, what would you call it? I was going to say a science fiction, but it's, it's an <laughs> extrapolation of science. So we're mm-hmm. saying there's, you know, um, people... We're talking about psychology here. Yeah, there's a good bit of psychology. Noticing differences in people, but then it's like... Uh, it's a replication and this replication and replacement of people mm. again it it could only be done through a science fiction technique it yep. could have been clones yep. it could have been shape changing you know aliens in this case it was seed pods seed pods yeah uh, plants and if you again if you tried to take that out mm. you would have a different film like sure you could say people are joining a cult yeah. but now that's a whole different Feeling and there are movies about that joining yeah, cults, is, which yeah. which follow similar lines where people join a cult or something and then they sort of change a bit, but they're still them and and, and there's a different resolution, it's a different conflict. Yeah, this conflict is against the alien and, and the fear of being, you know, absorbed and having yeah. free will removed. Yes, well, the, the science to me is what I was saying before in the the idea of doubt as humans. You know that that yes. idea of like not trusting other people and and even like what is the definition of a crazy or a story that we don't believe each other that is science isn't it and then on top of that this film is saying uh, you know the seed pods came from outer space um also i think when i've i have seen a couple of the remakes of this film this was the first time i've ever watched this version like mm. i've never seen this version but in the remakes they definitely don't factor in that psychology argument very for very long like from memory um it's been probably been a little bit while but it sort of jumps quicker into oh surrey's now an alien and you know what i mean like whereas in this film i really liked that there was almost like a you know our main character is a doctor gp and he even says look i don't know you know it's it's beyond it's beyond my pay grade he says yeah. <laughs> sort of thing like i don't really know but my my science background is telling me that no, it's not quite right. People aren't quite right, but then there are they're, they're people. They're, we don't have any documentation of suddenly people not being people, you know. And even when they did find that guy with the weird voice you talked about before, oh yeah, I was... <laughs> the writer. Even when they did find that dead body, he took a scientific approach, didn't he? Because that's why he didn't want to ring the cops. He's like, watch it all night long and see what happens. See when it changes. Yeah. See if it cha- if it changes, call me back. You know, like. And I looked at that and I'm like, wow, he's really coming at it from a scientific point of view. Like he's like, yeah, observe the experiment. Like this is not a human body. It sort of looks like it, but it's not quite. So there's got to be something here. He took a very scientific approach to it. Um, and then even when he, the next scenes where he is then, you know, he sees the girl's body and stuff, then the psychologist comes on and explains, oh, no, but you made it up. You invented that. It you, was very convincing. Human, and too. it was extremely convincing. And he explained it in such a very clear scientific mode, I thought. It was a very rational, logical mm. approach. Um, so, so, yeah, I thought this film was full of science, really. 
Oh, it was chockers. And I really loved the um, doping up everyone. Yeah. This, this doctor <laughs> just had his little cabinet there with unnamed and unspecified drugs. He'd, he'd give this kid one of these every four hours. Yeah. What was that? It's a good sedative. That's what it is. It's I'm, Valium or something, right? It's, it's probably something like that. Yeah. And then... Yeah. And when the girl is... When the wife is really hysterical, he just like pours a big glass of wine straight up. Oh, get that into you. That would make you feel better. Yeah, yeah, Like, yeah, yeah that'd make anyone feel better. Chug it. <laughs> and then he gives him a couple of no-dose pills or yeah. whatever they are, like... Yeah, we're not going to sleep tonight, love. Yeah, here you go. go. These will help you stay awake. I'm like, that's speed, isn't it? Yeah, like, that, like it's basically it, medical speed. Yeah, 1956. It yeah. would probably use. Yeah. So yeah, that was that was quite nice. Nowadays, I don't think doctors have little medicine cabinets with um, anything no. more than they've, they've got. I do know they have like you know um, what do you call it samples. They get of samples, some but basic sort of drugs like you know nah. here's some Panadol, here's some ibuprofen, here's a. Yeah, especially in Australia where a lot of that is so heavily legislated, right? Like, it, I mean, I remember they used to... Uh, codeine's a good example. Not that long ago, you could buy uh, codeine, like, you know, a version of codeine over the counter at yes. the chemist. Now you can't. Like, you have to have a script. So, but back in 1956, you just went to Dr. Miles and he could just go, you know what? Yes, yeah, sorry, you need a bit of speed tonight. Yeah, let's let have some speed tonight. That will get you through. You go there, you go, I'm trying to do a podcast, doctor. I'm trying to stay up. I'm trying to work really hard on my business here. Yeah, here you go. Have a bit of have a bit of this. Oh, Take oh, the, the, the doctor just like pulls out a little syringe, fills yeah. it up, sticks it in sticks his own it. neck. And then, <laughs> <laughs> okay, go. That's yeah. right. Okay. Um, what's one recent sci-fi or creative thing that you are up to at the uh, moment? Recent creative thing I'm up to. Oh my god, I'm not very creative these days. Ugh. Well, I'm. I've been. Um, well, just make it up. Be creative. <laughs> oh, be creative. Well, I'll tell you what. I, I, I had uh, some company at my writing group, which was nice, where we discussed mm. various topics of writing and creativity, awesome. and uh, that was kind of cool. So. Ooh. That was, that was nice. Nice. Yeah, I've been looking at... I've been nerding up on tech stuff, actually, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Uh, a lot of alternative, uh, what do you know, renewable energy information, virtual cool. power plants, um, that sort of thing. Mm. Very Is that to lead into a new novel? No, it's just because I find it fascinating. <laughs> there's, there's this new wind turbine. It's 242 metres tall, if you can imagine. That's, yeah. that's freaking massive. 16 megawatt capacity. Have have so it's not quite what you're saying, but have you looked at how we're in a council called City of Mandra, and there's a couple other councils they've signed up to waste to energy. Waste and they're going to they're yes. going to build this plant like it's all contracted. It's, it's happening, and um and that's why then our government has talked about you know no like you they want everyone to be our, our West Australian government wants everyone to have the three bin system. And then Mandra said, well, no, because we've signed a contract for five years of this waste to energy thing. A have you looked much into that sort of system? Because my when I hear that, I'm kind of like, yeah, but surely the pollution isn't the greatest from that. Yeah, I know but that's then, the problem. But then it? I have also read how just taking rubbish to the rubbish chip and like burying it really is a natural disaster waiting to happen over 50 or well, 80 or they, 500 they, years. They do burn this in a closed system. Mm, and so they sort of break things out of it, it's, apparently. It's not just sort of a, a basic um, furnace with a chimney going up. Oh. <laughs> yeah, just chuck in garbage yeah. bags There's and stuff. There's a bit of fire coming out, love. Well, black black burn smoke a bit. out the top. So the, I know it's not... Yeah, I yeah, agree. Yeah. They, they burn it in a, in a sealed system. Yeah. It's, um, there is obviously some pollutants that come mm. out of it, but... Those pollutants were there already anyway. Yeah. Um, and I guess if you're avoiding the breakdown of toxins over 500 years, maybe yeah, they, it is could, better to like break them down now it. very quickly and then you're like, and, you, and you're creating energy from that. that they do it at used. a very high temperature. Yeah. So, so. It, it breaks most large organic compounds yeah. down into yeah. like carbon dioxide and, mm. and ash. Uh, isn't it really super interesting? But it's the same as like a couple of those major renewable projects that then straight away something like the water corporation goes we'll just buy the whole energy of that mm. for our desalination plant yes so they're like so they've just come on board and they go yeah we need you know you're going to output 20 kilowatts or something i don't know what the number is i'm not into the numbers 1.21 like, gigawatts yeah whatever right like some huge amount they're like, oh that will go into the no no water corp will just buy the whole lot yeah because then we can just offset our the fact that the desalination plant 
generate needs so much more energy. <laughs> yes, so much. <laughs> and we want to appear like we're green, you know? Like, it's really interesting, isn't it? Green, brown, whatever. So, what about yourself? You been getting up to much? Well, unfortunately, I am looking for jobs, and that is consuming a lot of my creative time, but... I was a actor in a little film last week, which oh, nice. was totally out of the blue. I had to run in the ocean fully dressed to save a young girl, be the hero, so to speak. I was did, the hero. did you succeed? I did succeed. She was, nice. was going to kill herself. So it's not sci-fi related, but film set related. It was great to be on there. It was great to... I'm normally directing, so it was interesting to have another director and all that kind of stuff. It was very spur of the moment. Also got to go on uh, local radio in Rockingham and oh, talk yes, about right. Space Brains, which was cool. Uh, it was a really great chat with Inspire Radio. So if, you, um, if you're into internet radio, you might want to check them out. They've got some pretty cool programs. This was like the entertainment three hours on a Thursday program. That uh, He's a filmmaker himself, Brenton. And uh, in talking about it, he's like, oh, I might need to, him, he was saying he might need to make a sci-fi film for Space Brains Film Festival. I think he might. And I'm like, go for it, man. <laughs> but we had a great, like, he was a really good host as any, we did a bit of a deep dive on sci-fi and we did a bit of deep dive on, on Space Brains and where, what Space Brains stand for and stuff. So, and talked a lot about the festival. So it was a really great chat, actually, over an hour and... Um, yeah, it's a, it was a cool little program and he's, he kind of wants us to come back and have another chat in the future. So, and he wants to know more, or, you know, come into the festival himself. So that was exciting. So what, but I'm talking about the festival. Sorry, what festival am I talking about? This would be this Space Brain this might be Sci-Fi news to someone. Film Festival. <laughs> yeah. It's held, uh, it's currently open to submissions. There's Definitely. lots of categories, so get stuck into it. Early bird category is ending at the end of August 2021. Yeah, so... So I if think, you want to get in with a super cheap price. I think it's already passed. <laughs> yes, by the time you listen to this, yes. it would have passed. Whoops. Yes, we, we are... You'll be on then the next travelers. cheap category. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be on the main entries, so yeah, like the, yeah. the, the primary, like the real yeah. entry. I have had a couple of questions of people saying, oh, on the 31st of August, is that it? It's like, no, 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 it's like all the way to March next year. Um, it's just kind of, there is a couple of categories where the price goes we want up to get by you a in couple early. of dollars. <laughs> we want to get you in early to make it easier for us to know how many films to judge, what sort of programming we can do. If, if we did, if it was I mean, all the way up to March, and that's when we're getting all the films in. Yeah. We wouldn't have much time to no. figure out the programming and, and you know, assign categories and all the rest of it. And so we, we are getting a lot of people submitting. It's great. Yeah, it's quite a few. Yeah. Every every week we get more and more. Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, we also got the, the local council saw, yeah, d- despite mm. our, our, our previous overtures to them, they have now seen our advertising, <laughs> seen our media uh, in the news, newspaper yeah. and so forth and have come along and said, oh, uh, you know, how can we help? We so want to nice. be part of that now. <laughs> yes. So that's good. And we yeah, want them to be part we of it do. too because it's going to make life fun and much easier for everyone. So you can make a sci-fi film, short or feature, enter it, Film Freeway uh, is the place to head. You can also go to our website to find out more details and the categories, etc. You do have a fair chunk of time from now, August through to about March to make a film. There is some different submission timings which just equates to the price of entry to it we will be having a film festival uh in mandra at Manpack, the performing arts center and uh which, which will be like a red carpet gala event surrey and i will be all dressed up and looking spiffy will we or are we going to be wearing jeans and a t-shirt probably jeans and a t-shirt. that's I mean, what i meant tux- that's I, what i meant i, I mean did... right now we're sitting around in our pajamas i've got a tuxedo i'm thinking of doing the, the tuxedo you could go the tux yeah i think you would look very good in a tux i've got a very actually. beautiful little blo- uh, bow tie know, like, like doctor who and everything <laughs> I, I i'm all for it i'm all for you and a tux not a tux i won't be no a tux, tux. a tux <laughs> I thought you'd uh, seen my uh, last weekend's activities. Oh, okay. Hello, hello. So before we deep dive in down onto what the hell Surrey is talking about, let's talk about Invasion of the Body Snatchers in terms of some more filmic details. Filmic details. Yeah. Yes, of course. How about a br- I don't hey, want to talk about your filmic details. Hey, Mark, Sorry. <laughs> how about a brief overview of who made this film and when? That's right. So this was directed by Don Siegel. Now you mentioned Clint Eastwood. He had Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood himself has said that he was he basically learnt everything as a filmmaker. So not Clint Eastwood, the actor, but the filmmaker. If you don't realise that Clint Eastwood is now 
directed about 30 films in the last 10 years because he just churns them out. Uh, he's got an office in Warner Brothers out the back and a, a studio. They just like, they go, yeah, he's fine. He can just record whatever the hell he wants. He goes out, he shoots stuff and, and uh, he's been making some pretty cool stuff, Clint Eastwood. As a director, he actually said he learnt everything from Don. Um, Don won a couple of Oscars for his short films in the late 40s. He was known as a bit of a B-grade, the, the sort of American thing of B-grade films. This was considered a B-grade uh, film. It was a, I know. came out as part of a double feature. Yeah. Which, so, so the A film was the one that came first, mm. and this was the second film, much like a B-side on the single, really. Yeah, sort of that kind of concept. There was that out of the 50s, 60s, especially this idea of B-grade films. Uh, some of the best films, I think, ever are, are those B-grade well, films. Like, it's, one of the, it's one of those things that there's plenty of singles that have got like the B side yeah. is actually more famous than the It's more fun, main isn't it? Single. Yeah. And I, I can't remember any of them now off the top of my head, but they're yeah. there. I don't think you would look at this film now and think any lack it, there's anything lacking, you know what I mean? Like it's a tight story, it's got special effects, it's it seems to have solid actors. I mean, I didn't I don't know any of these actors and their material, but they all were delivered Camera works really on the rule of thirds. You mentioned before the detective nor this film. The shadows are intense in this film, yeah, and that that matches the genre, the horror sci-fi genre that it's doing. Um, but yeah, I th- I think Don did a, like a really great job. He's a, he's a filmmaker he's that really old-fashioned. You know, they they don't kind of make them like this anymore. But it is hard to make a feature film now, and I, I feel like back in this era it was hard. But I think a lot of filmmakers got an opportunity and then they just kind of it was like a real working man's industry you know they just kind of mm. go like oh I'll do another film do another film now it's more like oh I've got an idea for a film sure you know it's going to take you four or five years to get it off the ground and get it up and running but Don seemed to make he's you know he had an extensive career in TV and film in the 40s 50s 60s 70s 80s kind of thing you know so huge filmmaker Mentioned before, written by Daniel Mamre. He's written a whole bunch of stuff. Jack Finney uh, wrote the original mag- magazine serial, which I think became a book, and Richard Collins is part of it. The actors, Kevin McCarthy, who had a massive career for many, many years, Dana Winter, Larry Gates, King Donovan, and Caroline Jones. It was filmed just purely in California, and it was, a to me, sounds like a massive success. The budget had a pretty healthy one at the time of 417,000. I yeah, think I if you that equated sounds... that to today's dollars, it'd probably be about $50 million. <laughs> that would get you a camera and a cameraman. Yeah, if you're lucky. Uh, and the box office was $3 million. Now, those numbers sound low, but I think if you chuck inflation in, <laughs> hey, hey, actually, it's I probably know. something of if like spend... $40 million and a return of three hundred million. That's what I'm going to put onto it. Sorry. If I spent four hundred thousand dollars now on a film and got three million back from it, I'd be pretty chuffed. So I would say, uh, by anyone's book, that that's pretty successful. Yeah, well, that's kind of like eight times the cost, hey? Something like that. Yeah. All right. Now we'd like to uh, start by breaking down the narrative with the, some common elements that you can find from all good story and script writing teachers. These are books that are available to anyone out there. Um, the ones I'm referring to are like Joseph Campbell, Blake Schneider, um, McKee and Field. Uh, they're all really great ones. There's some other ones out there. And in the story script writing teachers, they talk about the old-fashioned three-act structure to begin with. And then maybe they break it down into some specific moments, some what uh, I know Blake Schneider calls them beats. Beats that you must hit. To keep the rhythm of the plot. That's correct. That's I don't know what Blake Schneider really sounded like, but I just like to think that's what he did. You just added in a rap. There you go. (laughs) So we'll we'll have a look at it. I like the three-act structure because I like to think of it as Act 1 is the setup. Yep. Act 2 is the action and Act 3 is the reaction. So Act 2 is is what comes, you know, and each one is what comes from the one prior. So the reaction is to the reaction to the setup. Yeah based on what happened in the action and so on. And there's but, lots of ways we can describe it, like thesis, antithesis. And synthesis. And synthesis. <laughs> That's what Blake Schneider does. Yeah, it's it. another way to do it. But, uh, yeah, so when we're talking about Act 1, we're talking about having it were an introduction. So we have like an opening image which should 
because it's a video format, yeah. it should set the scene. Definitely. We get a theme coming through. We should have a bit of setup here. We should know some characters. So we shouldn't get too surprised by who the main character is. Like mm. They're in the first act. They don't turn up in the third act. Like that's no, that's not right. That would character. be weird. Yeah, that's weird. That's usually the villain might turn yeah. up in the third act. Yeah, um, we have like a an inciting incident or a catalyst, something which changes the whole setup we just saw, the opening image and the characters where you introduce their life, and then something hits them and starts to change or requires the choice of change or something. And I've got to say that that moment has to happen for me as a viewer. If it doesn't, yeah, I'm I'm kind of left wondering what the hell is this about. Well, the way I think of it is, Act One. By the end of Act One, so roughly speaking, the first third or quarter of the yeah. film, you should basically have in your head an idea of what the film is about, mm. like where this story is going. Like, so I, I like you look at Star Wars where Luke Skywalker, yeah, you know, some droids rock up, he finds old Ben Kenobi, and, and like. There's sort of this, um, that's sort of the catalyst. Like his life has changed. He's suddenly, these droids, he, he finds yeah. Ben Kenobi, but not, you know, you still, what's the film about? Yeah, yeah. So far, all of his own, he's gone and talks to him. Yeah. Comes back and finds that Uncle Owen and Aunt Doris or whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> I can't, the name escapes me, have been shot dead by stormtroopers. So you got the bad guy. Accuracy. Bad guy. Yeah, bad guy. And so suddenly, it's like, oh, and they're going to be coming after you and the droids. Mm. So he's, he goes, well, hold on what not well let's go get off this rock and save that princess yeah we know I know what the film's about that's right okay new elements come into it yeah um, and, you know the, the stakes right and so forth but that's the end of that sort of first scene the first act where we now know that there's you know a, a bad empire there's this, some sort of a resistance struggle someone's imprisoned and our hero is going to go and, and try to help rescue them yeah and because if he doesn't, if he decided, no, I'm not going to leave the rock, what does that mean? Sorry. The stormtroopers will probably just kill him. Just kill him. So it's the end. Yeah, yeah. it's the end. So, so by the end of Act 1, we, we should have, the whole film should be all ready to go. Yeah. And then we're just going to, we can Now we're ready back, to go. Let's go. <laughs> sit back to Act 2. What do we find in Act 2? So in Act 2, there's kind of development of that. So yeah, Luke Skywalker has jumped off the rock. I've got to find this princess. And it doesn't mean that it's all hunky-dory, but what it means is you have this protagonist, this main character that needs to go off and kind of have an experience. Um, and quite often Blake Schneider calls it, and I love this terminology, like the fun in games. And I know also he describes that quite often good films, this is the trailer. you know. So when we watch those one or two minute trailers selling us the story, that's basically the fun and games. So in the body snatchers, the fun and games is like, oh, they've kind of taken over the town. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, oh, they're not quite right. Like they're, they're dangerous, but are, they, are we really in mortal danger? You know, it's kind of like a little bit up in the air and, and there's the, and there's the, what we talked about, like the pods and so, and so it's like, oh, okay, these things are gross, but like how seriously should we take it? You know, if it's a romantic comedy, it might be that the person is trying to find their, soulmate and things are kind of not quite working out they're dating lots of different people you know and so yeah, they're having yeah, that like groundhog day is it that sort of montage scene where he's just taking he's waking up every day and it's the same day and he's taking advantage of it he's yeah. doing all the different things he can possibly do and he's timing it to get the money from he's the having a bit of fun and, with it yeah and yeah absolutely that's and exactly that, right and, and i think that's why that terminology like fun in games like it, it's supposed even in the most serious film or the most horrific film, it's the fun and games of that story. Yeah. Like it, so so it's got to be the bits that, as an audience, we invested our money in the film and our time, and we're kind of like, oh yeah, this is what I wanted. You know, like this is what they, you know, this is what we expected. Sort in of thing. Predator, Arnie is wiping out that. That's right. <laughs> rebel base with <laughs> yeah. machine He's guns. He's blowing He's stuff up. Some one flexing the muscles. And, you know, like yeah. yeah, it's all that exactly. That's right. what, and we see that, and we go. Okay, we're kind of happy now. Yeah, and we can also have a B story. So quite often that's a love interest or maybe it's even like a sub-character in the story having other things going on. And and so it's another kind of arc to the overarching thing. Sometimes it's a person, sometimes it's a story. 
arc. But then you hit the midpoint, which is exactly what it means. It's the middle of the story. So it's right in the middle of the film. And the idea of the midpoint is basically that things... You've had a bit of fun. You've had a bit of fun with body snatchers, but now the shit is real. Yeah. <laughs> it's time to get serious. Predator has come in and he's ripping the you know the uh, skeleton out of someone's body. You know, like there's got to be a moment in the story or the love interest. Of, none of them have turned out right. Like they're all wrong. We've had twenty fabulous dates with fun people, and it's hilarious for the audience, but none of it's right. You know, and that's the midpoint. So things have got to kind of turn there for the main character. And that's when you get things like the bad guys get closer, the scenario gets more serious. It's, we revealed, can... it's revealed that it was a bet to make the person the prom king or queen. That's right. You know, there's, there's other people at play, like trying to sabotage you. You know, Luke Skywalker, like the rebel, uh, the rebel, Um, what's it called? The Re- rebel, I'm going to get crucified for this. What, what are they called? The Enter- they're not Enterprise Rebel Army, whatever. It's like they haven't succeeded. They've actually been annihilated or they're being tricked. They're being lured into a trap. No, it is uh, a trap. You know, like Predator, Arnie's colleagues are kind of slowly being picked off one by one. So there's getting less and less of them and things are kind of getting real. And that, that's when you lead to some really dark moments for our main character. And you can call that like the dark night of the soul or, you know, like they're sitting there on the side of the road wondering why am I, what, like, why did I get to this position? And that's basically that moment that the character has to then go, well, what am I going to do now? And if they make a decision, that decision takes them into the third act. Third act. And the third act, I like to think, so by the end of the first one, we know basically what the story is about. The third act, we should see what it's really about. Yeah, now it's like the real game, This is the real story now. And it's like, it's that shifting point where there's a realisation... Uh, things have gone bad and then there's a plan. So uh, going to Predators, Predators actually got a really good three-act structure. Yeah, it is fantastic. So in that one there, Predator is pinned against a tree. He's covered in mud. Mm. The Predator can't see him. Yeah. And the Predator goes off now. Arnie makes a decision. Uh, he could just run at this point, couldn't yeah, he? Yeah, he could. But no, he's not going to do it. No. He now knows he's got something and this is that turning point which makes it act three. Yeah. So now he's got a plan to try and get the victory but I could kill the predator the real story yeah. here now is not just surviving no it's actually winning thriving and so he he sets up all of his traps and all the rest of it but the thing that happens often in this act three is the the main character he's still got something extra to learn there's something extra in the story mm. he has to deliver yep before we can have the victory and yeah. the predator yeah he Sets up all the traps. The predator, he initially starts succeeding, but then the predator is like, it's not an idiot. No. <laughs> Notices it goes, you know, feels it goes, oh, hang on, there's spikes here. That's not normal. No. You tricky little bugger. <laughs> I'm going to sneak around. Yeah. And the hero is now presented with extra danger. So the mm-hmm. act three finale has to have that little rise that, yeah. oh, yes, we're going to head out. You know, Neo says guns. We need lots of guns. Yeah. <laughs> And they do. They succeed in the lobby, right? Yeah, like, and they, they get Morpheus out of they, the building. They, they kick it, but then uh, the the traitor plays his hand. That's right. And people start dying. Mm. And you know, so more, Neo has to learn that next yeah. next bit. He's Star Wars the same thing, next. right? Like the Rebel Force, they kind of win. They start shooting the crap out of the Empire, and they're winning. But then they start to get overpowered, and they're going down. And then for Luke, he has to sacrifice himself into the uh, the Dark Star. You know, yeah. like, the, like okay, I'm the one that's going to go in there and do this. And he has to you know, trust like, the Force. He has to trust yeah. it, yeah. And if he, if he decided, he was like, I don't know if I want to trust the Force. <laughs> yeah. Again, that, that's the thing. The, the, you, in that moment, it's the same in Predator. He has to trust, like, his own instincts versus mm. this creature that is far superior than him. So that's, that's the three acts then. And then... The, we have the final image, which ends off, which usually has some sort of a throwback to the first, the opening. It has some sort of uh, resonance with the opening image. Often it is, sh- re- some some movies, a lot of movies actually literally show the opening scene again. Yeah. Different. You know, which the hero m- now is walking through all confident through mm. high school. Or in this case... Uh, in Body Snatchers, we do actually have it. It starts in the hospital, ends in the hospital. Yeah, and, and in the hospital though, he's... He's now calm and collected and things yeah. are turning out. 
when he turns up, he's hysterical. Yes. Yes. So anyway. So he is hysterical <laughs> at the start of this film. And yeah, I, I know there, there is some controversy around the term hysterical. Well, but it's the 1950s. It's like, oh my gosh, how hysterical. <laughs> well, interesting. It was just Just have some pills. This. Have some pills. It was actually at the beginning of the 50s that the psychiatrist uh, formally struck the term hysteria and mm. so forth out of the books not to be used because it kind of nice. conflates too many weird ideas. Yeah, nice, And nice, also nice. comes from the Greek uterus, which implies, you know, it's what, it's what women get for having mm. a uterus. Jeez, did they start doing that in the 1950s? Wow, yeah. we're really behind in Perth. So in the 1950s, they finally said... Uh, <laughs> Stop yeah, saying you know hysterics. What? Men also are uh, uh, hysterics. hysterical. <laughs> has nothing to do with the uterus. Uh, so no, I, I'm totally in hysterics all the bloody time, sorry. Oh, Jeez. We've got kids. Yeah, that's right. So, so act one, opening image. What is the opening image? Uh, police rush into an emergency ward. Oh, and it says emergency about five times. I really that noticed that. Uh, rush in. There's a man in total hysterics. Oh, he's, he's hair. But he's man, he's hair, yeah, he's his crazy. eyeballs. Oh, my he's God. like police are holding him back and this doctor comes in and they're just basically literally saying he's he's in he's in hysterics. He's got this crazy story. Um, he does identify himself as a doctor and this, this other man, I think it's Dr. Hill, says, you know, like, calm down, like, tell me the story. Tell me the story, you know. Yes. And again, I, I like this. Anyone that's a modern-day writer, filmmaker... There's, you know, like there's a, a minute of film here and then we're flashing back. There's, it's not slow, this film. In fact, it's, a, it's an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. So it's, it's really like quite brief, you know, versus those Avenger films. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> like the modern day Avenger films. But, but no, what I mean is like quite often a film is 90 minutes. This film is 80 minutes. Like that's great to me. Like I really like how tight this film is. Uh, but anyway, straight away we're into then him saying, oh, yeah, I was away on a convention as a doctor. And I came back, you know, and I, and I um, came back to my town and I should have realised straight away something was wrong. Yeah. But everything looked okay. And that's kind of like his opening monologue. Well, this is monologue. what I liked about the, uh, that noir style yeah. and the immediate mystery. Because Correct. Because he, he's just coming like, this is how you would start a novel. Yeah. You sort of, you'd, I don't know whether you'd had the flash, but you know, you'd start a novel with, I came back from the convention and thought everything looked, just normal mm. but I was wrong yeah you read that I should have known everything was wrong yeah and you sort of go oh why what <laughs> oh yeah 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 so it's, it's it's really sort of draws you in that within a, a few minutes mm. we're already being told things are wrong so he's come into Santa Maria his name's Dr. Miles Benno he's kind of his secretary says there's been lots of people wanting to see him but then kind of not coming and um, and that's weird you know like he's had lots of patients they kind of talk about some patients, him and his secretary on the car drive uh, back to his office. Um, and on that car ride, he a little boy runs out on the road and he screeches the brakes. Little Johnny, I think it is. Little Johnny, little Johnny. They're all called little Johnny. They're all little Johnny. And, and the other thing that's a bit weird is that then the little boy's mum says, oh, no, look, he just doesn't want to go to school. So that seems perfectly normal. You know, you yeah. and I have little kids, you know, they, there's days they don't want to go to school. I never wanted to go to school. And uh, but then what's weird is the fruit stand. Jokes on you! You're a teacher. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I, do. I still don't want to go. Um, it, actually, when you become a teacher, you less likely <laughs> want to go. But uh, there's a there's a fruit stand, I suppose, and it's it's sort of like um, it's all broken down and decaying nice. already. And he and he does say he goes, I, "That should have been a sign to me." And this is what I was saying earlier in this episode today that. The film, again, like he's getting a lot of information, right, as a human. Yeah. But he's not acting on that information. He's doubting everything. Well, that, that's because we live in a world that follows certain rules. Mm, yeah, I know. Like, social and cultural as rules. As a doctor, you can't just go, what's going on here? Why isn't your fruit stand working anymore? You know, like, what are you doing? Something must be wrong, you know? In, but in he the, felt it. So, so this is the the sort of setup there, where he gets to the doctor, his doctor's office, mm. and and it's just like it seems like it's just the ordinary run of the day sort of stuff. So, what patients do I have to see, and how's it going? Oh, funny, they've just cancelled their appointments and stuff. Oh, but here's you know, um, little Johnny and his grandmother or something. Yeah, yeah, and Becky who. Uh, well, <laughs> how was this Becky? came in in that dress. Oh yeah. Like it was like she was going to a ball, I thought. Oh, like it was like, like it was an amazing dress and they've really dolled her up and 
and uh, and she's like, oh, what? You know, I'm just come here to say hi on my break or whatever. And uh, and I was thinking, well, he is a doctor, so maybe she's just really after that coin, you know? Like she really wants. I the don't ring. think she needs to look at her dress. I know way. the dress, the way she's dressed and, and looks, she's not hard up. But I think it was a 1950s thing of like you know women dressing to impress the man and you know like and then the man did other things to impress the woman and now we're just all slobbing like now we're just all slobbing it (laughs) yes burping and farting and carrying on it's great speaking about bowel movements (laughs) (laughs) talking about bowel movements yeah that's right so anyway that that's the sort of um we learn the setup there we we, we learn these things and, and the boy comes and says his mother is not his mother mm. little Johnny and he's with his grandmother and yeah the doctor gives him a couple of pills, pills so to take, calm take, the, down, take yeah. the pills think you should probably stay at John because I think he's starting to act on this we're starting to see that that acting you know the setup is starting to come to the end he's starting to enter into the into the catalyst yeah where we're well, starting, he's starting to go yeah maybe he shouldn't go back to his mother's let him calm down well, yeah I'll I'm sure I can sort this out. Well, to me, it was still the setup because he, the boy, does that because at the, with Becky, so the girl, the the flashy girl, she she reveals a couple of things. One in the in the plot that she'd come back to town divorced, like that's why she'd come back to town. And Doctor Miles says the same thing, like he's come back to town divorced as well, like mm, it didn't. Okay. His marriage didn't. And they work had out. a bit of a thing. Earlier. Yeah, they that had sort of a thing in high school, high school sweethearts. Were, but Becky also says that her cousin Wilma is concerned about Uncle Ira not being Uncle Ira, and so Doctor Miles is like, "Well, hang on, I've just had this boy, you know, saying that his mum's not his mum, and then now you have got a your your cousin is saying that the uncle's not the uncle." Like so, again, and I liked this in the first act of this film that. There is a lot of doubt and psychology starting to play out. You know, the science, the science for the GP, the doctor, is, and he says it a couple of times in this in this setup and in the debate. Like, well, I'm not a psychologist. We need a psychologist on this. You know, yeah. we need someone else that's a bit more of an expert. Like, I don't have the term. I think he says something like, I don't have the terminology even to say it. No, you I, know, I, like I think he says something like, oh, I could I could use some you know of the terminology I, I learned. Yeah, but I don't know. But what I, don't, I don't really know. <laughs> um, so, and then that's what to me leads to the catalyst. And you might disagree with me, but to me, it's like then he decides he kind of changes himself and he decides to visit Uncle Ira and speak with Wilma. And we, it's a good scene because we it jumps like we don't see him talk to Ira. We we just see him come over to Wilma and go. Well, that's Ira. Like, that's the man I know is Ira. Surely there's some like, things that only you and what, he know. Yeah, and, and he, he kind of that. like, yeah. yeah, he kind of quit. really gives Wilma the third degree, doesn't he? Like, he mm. really kind of gets in on her grill, which is like what we do as humans as well. It's like if you started telling me something that I thought was suspicious, we we kind of really grill the other person. We don't just go, yeah, yeah, you're right. Mm. You know, something's wrong. It's like we go, no, no, but hang on. Have you tried this or have you tried that or have you tried this? And... He really does that. He, and to me, that's the catalyst in this film. Because when he leaves with Becky from Wilma, he actually even says, the voiceover, he says something like, there was alarm bells ringing in the back of my head, but I still didn't really believe the story. Yeah. So there was, there was a part of him going, yeah, this seems weird, but I'm not going to go down that pathway. Yes. And, and so to me, it like started the catalyst of the story there. Yeah, and, that, and that's where... As the audience, you're starting to get a, a whiff of what's some mystery. You still don't really know how the story's going to go. Like, uh, is is it going to be the mass murder is going to happen? Is he going to run away? Is he going to try and fight? Is yeah, we're, we're not sure yet. But that's okay because we've got we've got a bit of bit of debate for the the main character. Oh, Miles yeah. is he's not sure. He's still kind of uh, well. I'll you know send old Wilmer off to see the doctor. Yeah, and sure enough. On little Kaufman, date. Dr. Kaufman. Kaufman. Dan Kaufman. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Kaufman. But he goes on a date with Becky, which is, and again, she's in a nice little black dress of some sort. Yeah. Black. It's black and white film. It yeah. could have been dark green. It's a beautiful dress. Yes, it could have been dark green. I'm going to assume it's dark green now. But they, they, they happen to run into Dr. Dan Kaufman. Uh, with a surgery surgery friend, yeah, like a friend who's the, so the doctors are all hanging out with the, the doctors, doctors, right? Like, like and yeah. and it's this nice, real small town feel because yeah. they know, they greet each other, and he says, "Yeah, oh, Wilmer is having trouble. Thinks that Ira, someone else. Ah, oh, yes, it's been going around a bit. It's 
seems to be an epidemic of mass hysteria. I know. It's a good line, isn't it? And he's like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> and then we have, the, we have the, the nice little kiss, which is, uh, this uh, is a one of the Chekhov's guns. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's like, they're dancing in the hand, you know, it's me. Mm. That's how I know. It's <laughs> That's you. how I know it's you. <laughs> and and you know, if you're experienced in these sort of plots, you go, okay, that's going to be a test yeah. later on. Yeah. But it's also a nice moment in the film oh, because it's, he's. It's it, lovely. They're, it's they're it's a funny. Nice couple, aren't I don't know what you thought, but it's like it's almost like, and that's what I mean. I think she showed up dressed in that ball dress, and it was OTT. But it's like then he was being a bit he was being flirtatious in the male way. Like he kept dropping like hints in his language and he kept sharing things with her and he kept being very male, like like, you know, oh well I'd love to spend all day with you and you know, there's a and uh, I know that you would um ha- like she says, How how do you know it would be me? And he like kisses like he just kisses her, ah. Oh, I know it's you, you know, and then and then she says, "Oh, you got to work on your bedside manner." And he goes, "That's for later." Yeah, <laughs> you know, like that was like so he kept, good. but that's smooth. what I mean. Like he kept to like you know, as an audience, you're watching and you go, "Oh, it's the it's the B story," you know, it's yeah. that idea of them developing. They're going to be the main characters well, I, in this. I story. really love that little interaction. He said, "That's your bedside manner." That's because that's her sort of going. So where is this going? Exactly? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because he could have just gone, "Oh yeah, ha ha ha." Yeah, but instead he went, "That's for later." Yeah. <laughs> So there's kind of this little... T- 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 yeah, hey, and it's the going? same when in a, a couple of scenes later as well when he takes her home and it's dark and she goes, she turns on the light, she goes, I'm afraid of the dark. And he's like, yeah, but the dark's better. You know, like he's, yeah. he's trying to allure to, you know, other things. Perhaps I can come on in. Yeah, that's right. So this is where then they get the they get an urgent phone call. From Jack. This is the weird guy's name, Jack, Jack. Balak. Balachak. Balachak. And yes. uh, the writer and they go to this guy's house and... It's a really weird reveal how they do it because they kind of walk into this room and he goes, turn on the lights. <laughs> and he gets Miles to turn on the lights and there's this sheet and there's something under the sheet. And it doesn't look like a full human body. You can see that it does. And, that, and again, this is old filming versus modern day filming, sorry, because they pull back the sheet and you don't really see it. Like you, you, It's like a wide shot, you know, yeah. and it's not, whereas in a modern day filming we'd have like that, extreme close up what the hell are we looking at you know whereas it's just the whole shot is kind of this more wide shot of the scene of the four actors and expecting to get a a sort of a a close-up yeah on the the no you don't need that in the 50s you can see the resemblance between jack and this fellow but you don't you always sort of never get it (laughs) you can't can't see it (laughs) and that's just what they did in this era like they it was more theatrical you know like this is the thing film came from theatre and in in the terms of even when film started to become mainstream in the 20s and the 30s quite often you do, and metropolis was the same you don't tend to get a lot of like close-ups when, when you go back to this era so you're exactly right i was the same they're like it would be great to see a close-up of this weird creature's face but we never see it we just no. don't get it we get the kind of traditional wide shot of them all going oh it's horrific but we don't actually get it the looks close-up. Weird. It's weird. It looks like you. Sorry. No, but, it doesn't look like me. Yeah, it kind of does. Well, see, you know, like, the, the, but you never see the creature. You know. The, the nice part here is, is it is now confronting. See, up till now, uh, you know, there's, there's there's still this doubt of, you know, I go, yeah, we'll see the doctor. Yeah, weird. Yeah. And then now you're confronted. Okay, so what you're going to do now, doc? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now yeah. you've got a body mm. that looks weird. It doesn't have fingerprints, and he's a doctor. He's examined people, and he's looking, going, yeah doesn't look like a person it looks like a person but not a person yeah it's too thin it's not quite right it's not quite developed they do the fingerprint test and and he, he goes oh let's do the fingerprints and then we do get a close-up that's just like splodges on it and, oh they don't have fingerprints not imprinted yet yes. and and this is what i liked and it's funny that then a couple of scenes later the cop tells them off over it but i did like that then dr miles says you know, you just watch it for the night and get back to me. Like, yeah. call me back if it's an emergency. I mean, in one side of the fence, you could be like, are you shitting us? Like, this is a creature that's growing here in this room or something. It kind of looks like your friend. <laughs> Do you not want to kill it or take it to but, the police station? I don't know. But He leaves him there and he, he goes back to drop Becky off at home and they're like, comes in and, and he's, he's sort of getting a little bit romantic. Still trying then- to be frisky. <laughs> Dad comes in. Ed Bloody dad. This is what says, dads do. Oh, oh, you're here. So, yeah, well, 
how's it going? You want a nightcap? And no, not all. I was, you know, what were you doing up at night? So oh, I was just working in the workshop. Yeah, in the basement. Yeah. Okay. Fine. And then I leave. And it's after he gets back, you know, he... And yes, Becky lives with her dad because it's the 1950s. Well, he, she got divorced, so she goes back home. <laughs> That's right. Makes sense. Yeah. That's, you would probably do that too now. I mean, if I got divorced, I'd probably end up going back to my no, parents' No, I place. wouldn't. No. Go back to... But, know, it's, but no, but if you look at films now, sorry, they're not, they don't move back home with their parents unless no. that's the story of the film. They, they live uh, in a shitty apartment or whatever, you know? Oh, yeah, they always move to the You know what I mean? Or... Like, the girl would but, live... And also, even, like, a girl doesn't... But this is the thing. This is the error. Like, yeah, you did. You went back to your parents because probably a woman couldn't get a mortgage on her own or... <laughs> uh, anyway, that's a different... Topic for a different anyway, podcast. He, he, he goes, he leaves, he, he leaves Becky down and goes, okay, yep, see you later, and heads off. And we see uh, back at... Balachek's. Balachek's, don't we, where yeah. uh, the the woman, whatever her name was... The wife, yeah, the, the wife, wife. Jack's wife, Teddy. It's a kind of scary scene, isn't it? Because the, bo- the we got this kind of like shot of the body, and now it does look like Jack. Jack. It looks much it, more like Jack, and its eyes... Open. Yeah, and it's got a cut on his and hand. And then it's got the cut on the hand that Jack had suffered earlier. Yeah, so they... And it's bleeding, and so she screeches, hysterics. Yeah, she does that and... classic old scream. Like, And I thought this was interesting, like, Jack and that, like, Jack... Uh, and they, like, just run. They just run from this body, which, I don't know, maybe I'm not used to that, because in horrors, normally, they go in to investigate. <laughs> they're leaning close they, to their face. Yeah, they're like, their, what's going on here? And put they get, their hand they're, in yeah. his mouth or something like <laughs> Whereas this is 1950s, they actually just ran for it. Good on them. Oh, jeez, get out of here. Because even later, they also go, let's just run for it. I'm like, wow, this is weird. This is really weird. You don't normally run in horror. So so they run run back to uh, old... Miles' place. Yeah, Miles, and tell him it's it's happening, you know, and he goes and looks, and they they talk about... That's when he realizes Becky's dad. (sighs) Maybe Becky's dad is uh, being body snatched as well. and And he says that. He goes, I just had the feeling I had to go to Becky's. Yeah, so he he ran. He was in his pajamas. He was in his robes or whatever it was. He know. runs over, and then when he gets to the house, he goes, "I don't think it's." What was that? there was an interesting line of dialogue there? Something like, "I didn't feel like I would be welcome here," or something like he says something like that. Like it's yeah. a weird line, and because he went to ring the doorbell, and then he goes around, and just smashes the basement, and he breaks into the basement, goes, out, opens up this weird thing. He's got the old like it's a great horror trope, isn't it? Like using a match. To yeah. look in the dark, and it's like things are, you know, and it does look like there's weird stuff, like there's tubes, and and that was the thing I was expecting, almost like, like is is the dad growing a a Becky, yeah, you know what I mean, like growing her in the in like with tube, like Frankenstein, you know, like is he like turn, is he creating a Becky? Because again, we don't know how these body snatches are working, and he opens up a thing with the match, and there she is. There's a version of Becky. Yes. And so he like slams that down, runs upstairs, and he just does the real Prince Charming thing, doesn't right. he? Like scoops her Br- up. Bruce Willis diehard, like he just runs in, scoops her up, and like runs out the front door. <laughs> yeah, he, he he runs for it back and, and meets back with uh, you know Jack, Jack, and, Te- <laughs> and Teddy, Jack Belichick. I'm a writer. <laughs> I'm a writer. Yeah. This will make a good uh, novel next time. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, so he's even got a little pipe that he sucks on. Uh, yeah, they run. Look back on to- a side note, then I, I I feel like I'm in the wrong wrong era. I mean, like 1950s men just like they just smoked, they just drank, they just kind of like treated women pretty shittily. They died young. <laughs> they just died young. You know, so it looks like a good time. Sorry, it looks like a good, good time. times. Good times. <laughs> well, they went and had a barbecue. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. It's time for a barbecue, boys. So so anyway, they, well, they're discussing. He's trying to get through the FBI, and like you, you think. A small town doctor just calling, get yeah, in know. touch with the FBI, and you're like, really? Yeah, okay. And there's the, how lazy. I mean, we're so lazy. They complain that we're lazy now that we like go onto Google. Back then, they just rang up the operator. Operator, give me the FBI. Uh, they have, they're busy. Try again. I mean, geez, <laughs> I'm Doctor Miles. But th- this is here now. We so we, we they've got a bit of a uh, a bit of a turning point. They do. Act, this is to me. Act two is coming. Yeah. Is, is, well, it's coming in because they see the pods in the greenhouse. They do. And this this leads them to uh, This into escalates action. everything. Now yeah. it is. Now we know how they happen. Mm. Now we have some sort of action that has to happen. 
we know that there's going to be a conflict here. Uh, and and Miles is sort of putting it all together that, you know, her fa- Becky's father's in on it, other people are in on it, like is everyone in on it? Yeah. And, and, he's, and then he even says like, we've had this like rushing of like, ringing the op, you know, trying to get to the FBI and stuff. But it's like, oh, what if the operator is in on it? Yeah, if they've and got so the operator, we're dead. Like he says that line, right? Yeah. And then, and then that's where he can, his plan, and this is where we really go into the fun and games, is that he's like, you, Belichick, yeah, and Jack your wife, and like you leave town, like Start. you go now, you raise just go now alarm. and get how you know, raise the alarm, get help, and then we will get out later. Like, you know, so he's, I mean, and that's a good sort of like save the cat, isn't it as well? Yeah, because we'll, he's we'll kind of like, them, we'll lead them away. So yeah. You can get so out. you can get out. And that's, and that's what they do. They, they, they piss off and <laughs> miles, you know, tries another call and then he, he ends up taking the phone off the hook. And, and we have this pod scene where they all splurge oh, out and lovely. Haley is lovely as we described earlier. And there's a good moment here because he, he goes in with the pitchfork, the good old pitchfork. Man, oh, the pitchfork. Americans love their pitchfork. And they go in there and he goes in there and he kind of like looks at, I think, does he look at maybe Becky's body or yeah, something? First, and, yeah. and then he looks at maybe Jack's body or something. And, and he, 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 he's, he kind own. of, and then he sees his own. And he, he can't, and, and it is an interesting thing because it's kind of like, a, I guess, a moth or a butterfly emerging slowly where it's not quite the butterfly yet. Yeah. And so if you killed it, then, you know, like, you know, it's easier to kind of kill because it's not quite, the thing, but he can't do it. And then he sees his own body and he, he's kind of horrified by it, but then he does stab it. Well, it's okay. It's himself. It's himself. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, a bit of self-harm, but it's okay. Yeah. Uh, so he does st- stake his own duplicate body. He had such a great chin, this guy, eh? Yeah, yeah. Really had that freaking solid chin that they had. Like, it's like the Incredibles, you know? Like, <laughs> oh, he just had a solid chin, so this dude. That real American hero chin. Yeah. yeah. So Ben and Becky soon realise that, um, you know, they realise that maybe everyone's in on it, so they they run for it, um, and they they there's a there's a whole sort of sequence of them, you know, getting to a petrol station, and then he goes, oh, they put something in the boot, and then he, he opens the boot, and he sees that the people at the petrol station put put seeds in there pods in there pods in there so they, they're in on it and then so he burns them and then and then he goes oh i'll go to my you know receptionist's house so I'll, I'll, I'll we'll get help there and when he gets there he sees that they've got pods as well and they're all talking um and he's confronted by the police officer i think so he runs again um and so then they he runs and hides back at his medical office yeah because no one's gonna look there i did think that was probably a silly sp- space to go and hide well they went and hid in the closet or something around they they did a, a a brief walk through maybe they weren't convinced he was there so they just kind of looked in there and walked around and went no oh, he's not here and they went out and they they hid in there all night and they took a bit of something something to stay awake uh, and but then in the morning in comes jack like the door handles and yeah they've they've had their their moment where they've looked out the window and they've realized there's people you know all over the place and it's so early in the morning and like, well, it's yeah and that that to me sorry is the midpoint yes right because because they they've stayed up all night they're they're they're, they're surviving they're not doing well but they're surviving mm. but they set when they get to and they look out the window and it's kind of the town square and you have this huge amount of people kind of congregating and it's a really weird sequence like it doesn't look real it looks made up and and that, and he makes a comment as well oh, that's the only bus into town in the morning or something then yeah, and you something. see the police kind of like escort a couple of guys and they drive off and when they drive off then everyone comes into that tenter that that center square we're talking like a, a hundred people or something mm. and they come in and then these trucks come in and they've got all these pods on the back and they announce the police announces like family members go there and family members go to truck one and truck two and so it's a real like oh this is an organized yeah, this, it's like this like does big... involve the whole town you know like yeah. we are maybe the only people well, this is the the raising of the stakes towards the finale isn't it, it? Is, so yeah. up until now it's just kind of been dare I say fun and games and yeah. now and now it's like trucks filled with pods yeah. and they're going to the neighboring towns it's going yeah. to become an exponential spread where yes. they infect they had three trucks so they'll infect yep. three towns those yep. three towns 
each d3 and it goes yeah. up by a factor of multiple of three every round yeah if this was the 1990s we'd get that like military graph scene wouldn't we yeah well, the, the zombies the red, they love the, the red with <laughs> the like red, red spots yeah. this is where we are today the little red dot <laughs> in california tomorrow by, <laughs> by next then, week a whole yeah. east coast or it's a covid spread that. isn't it yeah so, yeah, we're getting these bad guys. Um, Kaufman and Jack uh, rock up um, at Becky and Benel and they, they, they confront them and they say they're going to have to, like, take them over and they kind of surrender. It's quite clever. They surrender and they've got their pods and you're going to turn, you know, you'll be fine. As soon as you go to sleep, you'll just turn into the, yeah, the thing. Yeah, nice thing here, these, these pod people weren't violent. No, violent. no. They were just kind of like, yeah, like, it's cool. you like it. <laughs> And, and I think the, I think that was the argument, right? Like the argument was like, after you become us, like you won't care, like you won't you won't. And that was the whole thing. It's there's no emotion because he says, yeah, but what about love? I love Becky. Yeah, what about your ambition? And, your your yeah, love and your that worry. Your I think Kaufman Kaufman's the one that replies and says, well, that's the beauty of it. There, there's none of that. Like you don't have to. You'll just be one of us. Like we're all one. We're all and I the think, same. Yes, we're all the same. I mean, I don't necessarily think this film delves into that, but it isn't that that sort of dem- democracy theme versus communism theme coming through? A lot of people like, do say that. I, I, I've not looked into it for this film, but I just think that that American idea of, you know, you're in the freedom of the West, you're in America, you get to say and do what you want, whereas that communism idea, you're... You're a, you're um, just one of many, and a, a you have to. Machine. You're a hive. You know, you you have to be a hive, and there's benefits to the hive because everyone just kind of works, and they're all equal. But obviously, then you don't get to like love someone if you really wanted to love them, and you don't get to just freely think. Anyway, just a bit of a side thought. Sorry, most people probably shouldn't freely think. <laughs> I've heard, well, I've heard their thoughts, and I've seen yeah. the outcomes, and perhaps Jeez. perhaps they should try again. And we are seeing that a lot at the moment with the COVID vaccine debate. So, yeah, yeah, I don't want to go down that path, really. But you're exactly right. It's like the guy that invented the seatbelt. I mean, did he really need to do that? You know, that's just population control, right? Like, do we really need seatbelts for everyone? Yeah. Like, if you don't want to wear a seatbelt, should you be forced to wear a seatbelt? Ah, uh, wow, well, that is interesting. <laughs> That's yes. my real dark level. I That's when I always should. I get to the dark. Uh, bit. Was this, have you? Uh, I was going. I was bringing up uh, Robert <laughs> Heinlein. He's yeah written a, a bunch of books. You know, if, you, if you wanted to be a pod person, be a pod person. Starship you know? <laughs> Troopers, for example, is, Ooh, yeah. is one that, that people would know because there's, there's a movie. The movie has only the most passing resemblance to the book. Yeah, but a, a big theme in Heinlein sings is it was in Starship Troopers and it's in. Uh, you know, the, the thing about the moon is a harsh mistress. No, what, what is it? Uh, whatever. The one about the supercomputer on the moon. Anyway, he, he always brings up this this point of personal responsibility. And in the movie of Starship Troopers, they bring up, you know, a citizen has a sense of personal duty and yeah. responsibility to do. And it's one of these philosophical points, which is like, if you are a, you know, a well-rounded, you know, and you take personal responsibility for things, you shouldn't be fettered by these yeah, laws, like nanny state stuff. Like you wouldn't need a law to say you've got to put your seatbelt on because if you know you probably will be wearing a seatbelt. But if mm. you're found to not be wearing a seatbelt, then it will have been a you know the result of a distinct thought process and a mm. conscious assessment and decision not to wear a seatbelt. Yeah, I like that. And that works all the way up to the point where you realise that we. As a population, we don't have a sufficiently high level of philosophical <laughs> training and, you know, free critical thought. Yeah. Like, many people do not do things based on rational self-reflection. Oh, damn it. And they don't carry with them a sense of personal responsibility. Yeah, And you can, you can true. see it just like you go to the train station, you walk down the beach and there's rubbish on the ground. Yeah. And, like, you know, like just around the corner of us, two guys got done doing 200 kilometers an hour on their motorbikes and one of them crashed, you know, caused danger to other people. That's the thing, right? Like you, if you don't wear a seatbelt and then you get hurt, 
you do affect someone else, which is like the ambulance officer that has to come and scrape well, you off I mean, the road. Like you probably like you there's probably also would. that, right? Like so 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 you could say I could argue like, hey, I've got free will. I don't want to wear a seatbelt. I'm risking having a car crash. I don't care. Like I'm making that as an educated person. Like I'm making that decision. But then if I'm in a crash and I haven't worn a seatbelt might just keep me in the car and I'm actually okay. You know, like I might have whiplash or something, but I'm okay. Whereas I don't wear it. And then I end up like splattered across the road somewhere. And then some poor other person who has their own free choice has to come along and scrape me off the pavement. Yeah. And then you go, but then you've affected their free choice. Well, see, the thing is, though, <laughs> what Heinlein often There's argues, though, there. is that you would have the person not wearing a seatbelt or choosing would be responsible and accountable and yeah, understand that's my fault. Yeah. the outcomes. Yeah. And so they would almost certainly wear the seatbelt yeah, by that's a matter right. of yeah. choice yeah, you because would. it is the responsible thing yeah, to so do. Yeah, so you don't need a law to tell yeah, me so to wear a seatbelt. you don't need belt. a law yeah. because you can do it yourself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's quite obvious that we're just we're not at that level. No, we're, we're really not. <laughs> we haven't evolved that far. That's what you're saying. And Sorry. maybe we need, maybe, maybe we need more. Can't be at that level. Yeah, I don't know. Because in different circumstances and contexts, some people, uh, you know, while I'm, yeah, you have a bad day. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, that's right. Maybe the only thing stopping you, you from doing something stupid is the fact that there is a a law that. Yeah. prevents people from murdering you. I don't know, yeah. like, or the only reason you're not killing someone one day is because oh, I just don't want to spend time in prison. Yeah. Like, the next day or three minutes later, you're back to being your perfect, rational, reasonable... It's very true. ...responsible very true. citizen that wants to uplift humanity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, along with the best one. But, you know, I mean, that's it. Heinlein it was, it was an idealist science fiction author, and this is one of the things that science fiction authors do is they come up with these kind of idealized situations but in this case here when we're talking about um you know becoming part of the hive or not it is that yeah it it leads into that same discussion there of how much how much do people actually have free will or how much do they actually how responsible really are we as people that's right Uh, and if you know surely the laws that are made are usually made ones like don't murder people uh, a sane, rational, reasonable person who's responsible and accountable and all, all you know, philosophical, they've thought about these things, they're educated, all the rest yeah, of it, yeah, yeah. would just not murder people. That's right. Because it's it's the obvious choice to not kill people. Yeah, yeah. It's saying that committing violence against people, you know, detracts from society, it causes damage, it's just mm. not something you're going to do. You don't right. really need a law against it. But we have a law against it because... There are times and mm. people who are in situations where they do strike out for whatever reason, That's and right. we have to remove them to uh, you know avoid further damage. That's right. If you didn't, you would end up with like a terrible anarchy. Before yes. it would get better, I think it would become self-adjusting. I think because mm-hmm. eventually, you know. If you're a complete asshole, the reason today that you're still alive is probably because of the law that says you can't be murdered. <laughs> That's right. So just think that your listeners out there, if you're a bit of a dick, you're only able to be a dick because we have a law against murder. Well, that, yeah. That, Otherwise, that, you would have been murdered a long time ago. Yeah, and and I think the thing is, if like you're saying with his rationale, eventually karma would probably come around. Like if you if you if you were the kind of person that did act logically all the time, uh, as we said with the seatbelt, for example, like not murdering people, you would just be a nice person. So karma would probably well, repay that because indeed. because there's enough assholes out there. And so the assholes would affect other assholes and those assholes would kill those assholes. They'd be self-loving. And they would just... Uh, that's the thing. And that's the idea, that's my joke originally about the seatbelt is that eventually if you didn't have... If people didn't wear a seatbelt, you would kind of probably get rid of a good percentage of the people that wouldn't wear a seatbelt anyway. Yeah, but the problem always comes down <laughs> when you're talking about kids. Yeah, no, I know and that's oh. the thing because kids wouldn't wear a seatbelt either. So. Well, it's, it's more but the case maybe. That, well, <laughs> you've got these people who are not responsible in charge of people, one hundred percent in charge. Yeah, like, yeah, they are their yeah. everything, 
And, yet and then that's that argument of like, think of the kids, think of the kids. We can't make an R-rated movie because think of the kids. You know, we can't make a video game because think of the kids. Well, that's you know, and that, that's where I, thing, I, I, you don't want me to start in that argument. It's not quite the same thing, but no, it is. It's it when is. you're in charge of a vulnerable person. Yeah. You, there are some decisions that, as a society, we shouldn't allow you to make. Yeah. Like, just because I'm in charge of my kids doesn't mean that I should murder them. No. Or abuse them. Or teach them horrible, racist things. Like, there's no law against that, really. But <laughs> but there are things that, you know... Yeah, I agree. But, so, but then it's like... It's until a, they become adults themselves and, yeah. are f- and well-formed and are able to make sane decisions then there's a certain thing we have to go, well, our culture says this, so we should probably follow with that until they're old enough and then they can fucking make their own choices. They can, yeah. Um, it, but it's a it's an argument we could spend hours talking uh, about. And I'm not going to talk about where you draw any lines in particular. No. I'm just saying that, that that's what it is. That is. Um, and that's what happens in this scene, right? Like he basically says to him, you can either be part of us or not, really. Like, well, you, well you're you, going to be part of us. Yeah, you're going says. to be part. You tomorrow, you'll be on our team. All right. Uh, and uh, he, do, Miles, doesn't like that, and so he, he kind of deviates a little plan of, you know, like, and I like this because in other films they don't quite often do this, but he, and I don't know if you picked up, but he kind of was like, well, you know, we could, we could just attack them, but no, that won't work. Mm. And then and then and then Becky's like, oh, but what if we, you know, like we could just run? And he's like, yeah, but they're outside. And they kind of like really, they had a moment where they thought things through, didn't they? And then and then he kind of came up with the brainwave of using the syringe, you know, like using his drugs. Yeah. <laughs> hey, the drugs. <laughs> and he goes back and he gets the syringe and he gives her a shrins and but he, you know, he thought it through. He's like, sit behind the desk because that gives you a bit of space and a bit of protection and. And then we'll, you know, he came up with a real plan, didn't he? You know, and I, I liked that because quite often movies that doesn't, that's not the case. They're just kind of like, oh, here we go. I'm going to syringe them. You know, like he really kind of thought through some pros and cons. So, and that's what happens. He, he kind of distracts them, attacks the two boys, smashes them with the, with his drugs. Uh, the cop runs in and then she gets in with his drugs Yeah, and they're all knocked out. And, and they, they head off now. Now they're, they're sort of leaving and they, they bump into a police officer and they say, oh no, we're, or we're with you now. And they pretend to be pod and, people. You know, they, they, <laughs> they, they, they wander off and wave their pod people flag, whatever that is, like a green pea on a... But unfortunately a dog runs in front of a bus and almost gets hit and Becky screams. Oh, she goes, oh no. Kind of gives, a, gives away and that they go, they're not pod people. Wait, hang on. We don't care about animals. Yeah, we don't care about dogs, uh, which distinctly makes them bad people. <laughs> well, I think so because because you know, uh, humans we care about dogs. Well, they don't they don't get particularly worked up about other life. Yeah, which is going to make them they're a bit uncaring. What happens when they do take over the whole world? I mean, yeah, yeah, and then what? I don't know. Yeah, they don't have any emotion or any drive, so who knows what like they just what type of hive is this going to be? They just kind of <laughs> hang around, I guess. Yeah, but maybe, maybe that's not the point. The point maybe is they start like, converting the dogs. Yeah, who knows? And once the dogs are with them, they won't run in front of trucks. Yeah, that's right. Um, and they, uh, yeah, because of that, they, the cop kind of runs upstairs. He finds what's happened and, uh, he, he sounds the city wide alarm. Yeah, they've got a big like, alarm. Is that something you know, that's some real? sort of, I don't know if it's a US thing or something, but it's just suddenly like, there's a, meh, meh, you know, across the whole town. And they're chasing after them. And, uh, yeah, Becky and Miles, they run and they run down this sort of remote road. And he says, we've just got to get out of town. We've got to get to this highway. And uh, and so he runs up this like <laughs> steeple, isn't it? It's like 150 steps or whatever. They run up that, and then the, and then the town just starts coming with their pitchforks. It's the yeah, old chasing them. It's the old pitchfork sort of scene, and they they're all kind of screaming and yelling after them. And there's a good chase sequence. They run into the bush and they run over their mat dunes and they run down the hill and they're kind of like chasing them on their tail. They finally run into the uh, And this is where we're getting kind of more, you know, heading towards that climax kind of, you know, things are getting worse and worse for our main characters. So things are not looking good now because they're on foot. They're trying to escape, but, you know, they've got a whole bunch of people behind them. They find this weird old mine shaft. They run in there and... Um, you know, you can hear that the crowd is coming, so they they jump out. Becky is also like saying that oh, she's exhausted, she can't run anymore, right. she's 24 tired, hours awake. she needs more of those 
bit more meth, really. Yeah, and more. um, but he doesn't have it anymore, so that's the problem. So she's coming down, <laughs> and uh, yeah, they hide under some planks of wood, and everyone runs through, and then they're like, oh, they're not in the cave, and they run out. Um, and and anyway, so there's kind of a little reprieve there, and they take a breath, and then they start hearing this lovely music and yeah. um so it kind of feels like oh maybe there's someone nearby that can help and becky's really tired and and he goes look i'll just just wait and i'll just check it out and because if it's uh, he, there is a good line he says like oh let's just hope they're as human as the music yeah sounds or something like that something like that. it's a nice line i thought i was like that's really really quite poetic so he kind of wanders following this sound and he comes over a, a kind of a dune or you know like a peak and looks down and the sound is out of a truck and it's a truck full of these pods and there's a whole big greenhouse where they're farming them they're farming you know hundreds of pods and they're just stacking them onto the these back of the trucks and so he like oh freaked out retreats he runs back down see to me this is like really you know like this dark night of the soul is- because he he comes back to becky and she we've seen her a bit like you know coming in and out of consciousness and he comes back and he's like oh no no you know it's a trick it's they're farming them that's you know we really got to get to that highway and um and she's kind of in and out of consciousness and he's like don't go to sleep because if you go to sleep you'll become one you know so he sort of passionately kisses her but he kisses her, she doesn't kiss him back. No. And he just realises straight away and it's a very... And this is that test uh, that yeah. was promised from that, the first act. That's exactly right, like you mentioned before. But it's, it's a very, you know, horrific moment because now she's not Becky Well, anymore. just earlier they've been talking about basically getting married and mm. she wants to have his children and doesn't want to become one of these things. Mm. And now she's like, yeah, yeah. You take your lever, whatever. <laughs> and he, so we, he, we multiply with pods now. That's right. So. And then, and then, and with that as well, she doesn't seem to be tired. And he like kind of creeps out of the cave and runs. And uh, she like, oh, he's over here, you know. So she's giving him away, and that that sort of picketing horde come running out of the bush again, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. He and he runs, and he has a struggle, and he's. At this point, yeah, he's fallen in the mud a few times, and he yeah. is looking now all dishevelled, like he at the start of the film. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, essentially, he does. He he runs out into the traffic, and, and this is the finale. You know, this is this yeah, is it. This runs is... out of the traffic, and the people say, "Ah, oh, look, no, they won't believe. Leave him. him. They won't believe him. He's just one dude." And they don't. This is the thing. Like he runs into this freeway kind of traffic, and people just tell him to shoo, get away. He stops a truck. St- he stops a truck. And he truck looks with, in the back though. And there's pods and full of pods. Full and of he's pods. Going, oh my god. Yeah, I know it's everywhere. You know, someone else tells him to get off the road. He tries to get into a car. They tell him to get lost. So, yeah, again, to me, that's a full circle back to the start that no one's believing him. Yeah. You know, like it's a, it's, he hasn't gotten anywhere really. And, um, and that's what happens. It jumps then to the hospital and those doctors and that are like, yeah, he's, he's crazy. He's a cray cray. This story's. Yeah. And old Dr. Hill's up. like, yeah, okay. He's sort of going, mm, uh, we'll probably have to admit him. But then admit the, him to the psych ward. Yes, yeah, so in the psych ward. But the, and he's like, no, it's the general hospital. Though, yeah. So, so in you know, up walks the uh, you know, there's a patient gets wheeled yeah. past, and the doctor goes, oh, that's quite brutal. And the guy yeah. says, yes, yes, he was driving his truck. He got knocked over. I think got t boned. Yeah, doesn't use those words so much. Knocked over. He's crushed arm and legs, and it's, it's he's in bad shape. But the funniest thing was that this the truck was full of these weird big sort of pods. Yeah. And suddenly the doctor goes, oh. What well, kind of pods? Yeah, I've never seen them before. Though. Yeah, these huge pods. We've never seen them, yeah. Yeah, and of course the, the doctor just heard the description of this. Of these pods. And yeah, so he goes, oh, okay. And he, give me so, the FBI. Yeah, give me the FBI. Because <laughs> the FBI was not, you know, had formed too long earlier. Though. No, no. I, I'm not sure when that was started in the 40s, I think. I'm, yeah, I think it is a post-World War II thing. Yeah, yeah. so it was a recent dis- deliver, uh, delivery, discovery or, or invention because they didn't have a federal bureau yeah. for doing that sort of thing. No, so he's like FBI block the roads, and so you feel like, oh, hang on, they're gonna contain. I, know, I was, I was wondering because I haven't seen this version. Yeah, I was wondering if they're gonna do the old, uh, yes, we know, and we they know. lock yeah. him in a room <laughs> with a that's pod. Right. You know, that's like, right. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think the the one with um, Donald Sutherland mm. ends with Donald Sutherland pointing and screaming like a pod yeah, person. Man, man. Yeah. 
Uh, so it does that little flip around of like, oh, yeah, you think you escape, but no, actually. Yes, come over here. You're delayed. safe. You're, you know, you're like, oh, it's the fake ending, isn't yeah. it? It's like, oh, you're safe. You made it past the fence and we believe you. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, because we're also pod people. We yeah, know. we know. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, and that's, that's the end. end. Yeah. So that's that kind of takes us through. It's a good final image versus the opening image. It is a flashback story, but it is sort of opposites from the start. Like he's not believed. And then at the end, he's, finally he is believed. So you finally he is believed. So you get that oh. resolution. Of, yeah. Of, and it oh, does okay. feel like that he, you know, that Dr. Hill saying, yeah, block all the roads, call the FBI. Like they're going to throw everything at it, aren't they? You know, yeah, where he gets yeah. that authority from, yeah. I'm not sure, but you know. Yeah. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> So what about ladder? This is a classic one. Sorry, where classic. does uh, body snatches go on your ladder? Uh, well, well, my body snatches it goes in. Does your body snatcher snatch a new number off one of your other films? Well, I mean, it has to, doesn't it? Really, it does. Uh, I'm going in there. Event Horizon and Metropolis. Beautiful. It's a. It's a horror sci-fi. Whereabouts are they on the on the list? They're they're right in the middle. You, right gonna, in the middle. You're going to get there right in the middle. Okay. You got to start with 2001. Yeah, yeah. Because you you got to enter the classics with the beginnings of modern space travel representation. Representation. <laughs> like like yeah. really that was sort of the 2001. I, I should say the, the 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 modern. Uh, realistic space travel, yeah. where, which a lot of like Interstellar is is the more recent version of mm. that, but it looks very similar. Like the yeah. everything displayed is is what was shown in this f- earlier film, and and you got to move through then, uh, you know, Alien and and uh, Back to the Future, Demolition mm. Man, these sorts of things. But right in the middle there, you're going to get hit with some Invasion of Pod people. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, look, I'm very similar on my version of the classic. I know I agree with you, like Space Odyssey is my number one and followed by Metropolis. But yeah, this Body Snatchers comes in at, I've, I've sort of like got it right in the middle. To me, the way I've got it is Alien, then Body Snatchers and then Fifth Element. Oh, I did debate yeah. because Alien is sort of another one that, you know, yeah, you get infected by the face hugger and then the alien comes out. It's kind of a Body Snatcher <laughs> it's thing. It's kind it? of also a Body Snatcher thing, but I, I do think it'd be interesting if you've never watched those films, if you watched Alien first and be quite horrified and then to come back to this sort of Body Snatchers, I think, again, like I said, the pod thing's a bit similar, it's mm. a bit different. But the overarching, this is much more mystery. So, yeah, I felt it would work right in the middle. But if you're out there doing your own ladder or have a look at our ladders, just see what you think and, you know, let us know on social media, are we in the right trace? Are we in the right sort of thing? Or, yeah, let us know about your own ladder as well. And if you've got some suggestions for future classics, then, you know, dump them on us. Definitely. Always open. I mean, I... You and I think this is a classic, but yeah, if you're out there listening, are we on the right path or are we doing films that you think are not classics or if you have your own classic? So, sorry, science-wise, what do we think from Body Snatchers? To me, there's a few different elements, the psychology, the sociology, you know, the actual physicality of pods being genetically the same as us or something as humans. What, What science do you want to talk about? Uh, the psychology. It's oh. wonderful. I, I majored in psychology for a little while there and then I realized it's going to take nine years to get my doctorate, my clinical psychologist <laughs> and then another three years to become a psychiatrist. I went, Phew, screw that. Yeah. I'll just go become a, I'll get a business degree instead. Yeah, it'll take three years and I'm, I can actually earn some money. Yeah, earn some money, you know, like, hey, why not? Um, but no, it was, it was interesting because he mentions the mass hysteria and this is something that's very interesting it is a real thing. Mm. It is not called mass hysteria anymore. Yeah, they stopped that sometimes in the 50s. Yeah, it's interesting. I didn't realize they'd stopped that, to be honest. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, I was just trying to find the exact date. I can't, I, it's on a different document I'm mm. looking at. But uh, it's now more commonly referred to as mass psychogenic illness. <laughs> okay, there you and go. And it, it is fascinating because there's no real... Um, known reason for it yeah uh or, or mechanism shall we say mm. it is basically uh what, what do you call that um contagious psychology right and it's it's particularly distinct from other sort of forms of things because you, you do get um 
people all believing in like conspiracy theories are not mass hysteria. No, they're they're a different form of like they're a, a type of contagious meme. Right. But um, but in particular, what we're talking about with with mass MPI, mass yeah. psychological psychogenic illness, which MP psych anyway is a silent <laughs> P, but you say the P and the yeah, that's not right. But anyway, it so it's going to have symptoms that have no plausible organic basis. Yeah, right. Okay, the symptoms are transient and relatively benign. Mm. So your leg doesn't fall off, for yep. example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you don't actually, you know, um, become gangrenous, for yes. example. Yeah. Uh, or or whatever. The, the it occurs in a segregated group. Mm. So it's not a general population. It's like a so a small town. It's a small it town, a, a small area, work. a church yeah. congregation, a school, yeah. that sort of thing. Uh, there's presence of extraordinary anxiety. Mm. Uh, the symptoms are spread via sight, sound, or oral communication. Yeah, okay. And this is okay. this is just mind blowing that you mm-hmm. can um, do this. And the spread moves down from the age scale. It starts with higher status people, goes to lower status people. Right. And it's that's interesting. Quite more common in females. Mm. Um. One question was asked of a of a doctor said, why females? And the answer was pretty much in first of all, they're more uh, fronted in society and usually come under more you know stress and anxiety as a mm. common day occurrence. Yeah. So that's another reason why we should be nice Mums. to people. <laughs> be nice to people. Treat your women well, treat your men yeah. well. Let's not have this mass psychogenic illness. Yeah. But the funny thing is there's, it is transmitted by, you know, speech or sight, mm-hmm. which is, you know, so there's no liquid transfers. There's no blood. No. There's no, um, you know, virus. Women do bacteria. talk more than men. I know you and I like to talk, but women generally do say a lot more words than men. Yeah. So that could be just people. part of it. Like that's just me, you know. But that's not, a, that social... Social side of it. They're, yeah. they're more like... Yeah, they're more likely to talk with other people. But that forms physical symptoms. So quite mm. commonly, headaches, dizziness, nausea... Yeah, right. Cramps, cough, fatigue... Well, it's kind uh, of the placebo effect then, isn't it? Sore throat, yeah. hyperventilation, watery eyes, diarrhea, rashes, all these sorts of things. Like these are measurable physiological effects. Yeah. effects. Mm. From and, and what they sort of basically today say is they're, they're measurably you've got a headache, dizziness, nausea, mm. but there is nothing going on in your body to cause that. Yeah, the mind. Your, your mind is able to, and this is that whole matrix thing where, yeah. where perception is reality. That's right. You, you perceive make it real. yourself to be having a headache, and so you have one. Yeah. And your yeah. body doesn't know the difference between having a headache because you think you should have one and having a headache because someone bumped you on the head. And I think that's what Dr. Kaufman was kind of saying, right? Like across the town, you've got multiple people saying the same story. Like they've kind of caught the same story and they're making it up. Yeah. That, that's what he was saying in the film. You know, like he, that, that's how he was sort I of explaining I liked it that he sort of said, okay, so you did go to Jack's house and you saw a body. Yeah. And so you don't think I made that up? No, well, there was like three or four of you there witnessing yeah. it. Yeah, no, that's real, yeah. Like, But that's that's a stress yeah. In, you know, producer. That That's going to set your brain into hyperactivity. Yeah. And then you're worried suddenly because there's these, these things you've you heard about people being replaced. Yeah. And then your your girlfriend is in trouble, so you rush to her house. And, and you, you see something. You yeah. open this, I think it's a wood stack you know, for yeah, your yeah. fire. But he's only got like a match to see it by yeah, yeah. and there's, there's lumpy things in there. So it could and, look like a person. And, you know, the, the match goes out, he, he closes the thing and, yeah, I, I know I've seen things that you think about yourself when you've been lying in bed at night mm. and it's quiet or you're just starting to drift it and you hear like a noise. Yeah. And for some reason, sometimes you think, shit, is that someone walking in our garage? Yeah. And then you listen carefully and you hear mm. some other noise and you're going, what? And you and it. You're trying to resolve it, but you can't quite. And you're thinking, "That's there's someone in my garage." Yeah, you know. And then it's just silence or something or other. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes you can finally go, "Okay, actually, no, it was just nothing." It's mm. like because the sounds weren't convincing enough. And then other times you need to actually go to the garage and like. But could open you well imagine though, yeah. if you had just come from a 
uh, you've just been mugged. Yeah. You know, so you're, you're all, you know, freaking anxiety yep. up. Yeah, yeah. And you're lying in bed and you hear noise, you go, shit, they come back for me. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. you would you would freaking lose it. And particularly then if you told your partner, you said, hey, there's someone in there, they've come back for me. They would go, are you sure? Yeah, 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 I heard the sounds. That, and then they go, yeah, I just heard a sound too. Yeah. And yeah. now you're getting this feedback effect. But uh, well, that, yeah. that's what my wife always does. She goes, did you hear that? Go investigate it. I'm like, there was uh, nothing. No, go investigate uh, it. You're yeah, like, I know, I've been told that. Uh, and it scares me. Because I, I go, I, it's nothing. And I, and I go up and like, uh, yeah, I go to the front door. And I think to myself, what, what if it is? What if there is someone behind? <laughs> what if someone is trying to break into the car? I'm like, I'm just wearing my undies. Like, <laughs> That's right. I'm not, I'm not like an action hero. I, mean, no, I don't know how to I'm not fight. Arnie and Predator. I mean, come on. And even if I did, I don't really want to fight someone. No. I'd rather just let them rummage through my car. I've got insurance. You know, that's yeah. what it's for. But yeah, I dutifully go, no, that's, it's not happening. Yeah. It's not really there. So I'll open it. But it's still that trepidation. Isn't yeah, it? that's right. And I play a game. I know I've got a, like a logical system of like, Turn on all the lights so that that way your eyesight can see as much as possible. You know, if you've got a torch or anything It'll also else, scare like turn it on off. Yeah, really. like scary. You know, but I'm like, I've got dogs, so I'm like, okay, like the dogs can come with me. You yeah. know, <laughs> not that that ever saved my life, but I know that people don't like dogs, so it's like, get it going. You know, do, the, do just sort of do the logical things. But you know? so here, here's like uh, an instance of an occurrence mm. of. MPI, Mass mm-hmm. Psychogenic Illness. Ooh. So there was an Emirates Flight 203. Oh, hello. September 2018. So this is pretty oh, recent. A couple of years ago, yep. yeah. Yeah, yep. okay. So 106 out of 521 passengers on a 14-hour flight from Dubai to New York mm. reported symptoms including coughing, sneezing, fever, and vomiting. Mm-hmm. The pilot notified the airport and ground staff and the personnel from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control yeah, met them and quarantined the plane in New York uh, and evaluated passengers. Eleven were sent to the hospital. A few of them uh, would turn out to have the common cold or yep. a flu. Yep. But the other passengers, nothing. Yeah, right. And wow. so it was just like, yes, there was just enough. These, these, they reckon. Okay, so these eleven people, or these, these couple of people who had the flu, were just spaced around in such a point where you got that sort of feedback. Cough, Someone's cough, cough sneeze, snuff, snuff. oh, I'm not feeling good. Can I have an aspirin? I've got a fever. And then, you know, anyone else that would go, and I get this too, when I hear my, my kids coughing, yeah, yeah, I yeah. often start <clears throat> yeah. clearing my throat and feeling like I've got a cough as well. And or the good old, they cough in your face. Yeah. I've then, had that, like I even had that two days ago and then the whole next day I'm like, oh no, am I sick? Yeah. Like you just, you can't, I can't get it out of my brain. Like yeah. I can't not think... Am I now sick? So if you and then get, quite if, often by the next day I'm okay, but it's like you go, oh. But if you got that in a confined space with yeah, other people starting airplane. to confirm it, mm. it would build up on itself. And sure enough, yeah, Definitely. you would start feeling sick, and you would start feeling. And then sick. you landed, and they put a big tarp over the whole blood. <laughs> but an interesting thing you brought up was the placebo effect. Yeah. Ah, uh, there's this wonderful thing called the nocebo effect. Oh, so placebo is where you're given, say, a tic tac, and you're mm. told. Here is an aspirin. Yeah. It will help your headache. Yeah, yeah. And you go, oh, cool. Take it. And your headache actually diminishes. You feel better. Yeah, you feel better. Uh, you took no. So this is kind of like this MPI thing in mm. that there's no plausible biological way a Tic Tac could remove a headache. No. Like it's just, it's just not. There is no, there's no interaction yeah. there. You could have, you could have given you a piece of paper and you swallowed it and you would have lost a headache. Yep. This effect was your body just deciding that it's going to get better and so it does now obviously the placebo effect only goes so far yep like it can diminish headaches it can reduce some fevers it can make your tummy feel a bit settled Mm -hmm. uh and and there is a famous surgeon in america that did it with knee surgery but but i don't we don't have enough time to go but but he he did he did that he literally he's a knee surgeon very well known and he did knee surgeries and then he he decided to do the full knee surgery idea, but don't actually do the procedure. Oh, yes. And it had positive effects on patients. Yeah. But anyway, that's something that people can look into. Well, they've also done (laughs) studies where they do get the medicine and, you know, the people who have an expectation of getting better get better. Yep. And the people that don't... And the people who have an expectation of getting worse get worse. And this happens with cancer patients. Some people 
given a diagnosis of cancer, even a, a totally treatable one, mm. will they go you know, downhill? They go downhill really and, quickly, and yeah. possibly die without yeah. the cancer actually killing them. They mm. willed themselves to death. So but, it's bizarre, isn't it? So the nocebo effect, though, there's an interesting one here about electromagnetic hypersensitivity. Ooh, I like. So here's this interesting sexy, thing. isn't it? Yeah. Well, people, people who who will report symptoms from uh, their Wi-Fi router, or yeah, from right. um, radio transmissions, mm. or electric motors, or wind turbines, mobile phones, mobile phones, five G, whatever. And yeah, and, and we're flat there. Earth. And they they do these studies, but we'll see. The thing is, these podcasts, people, these people genuinely have <laughs> symptoms. You know, they get headaches, yeah. upset tummies, nausea, dizzy. But when and so they go, okay, well, we have to look into this. So yeah, the CDC says, well, let's let's look into this, track the occurrence and reportings of these, and they 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 were occurring in little blobs around, like not, mm. you know, like hot spots. Yeah, and but but not following typical population trends like or mm. and and it didn't have anything to do with the density of electromagnetic fields mm. like you'd expect a, a city which is just bathed in em like radiation constantly yeah yeah there's light globes there's electric motors there's compressors there's cars driving trains. past this there's, there's electric trains there's people with mobile phones everywhere everything is like transformers you'd expect that just to be a big cluster you'd expect that that would just be chock full <laughs> and yeah. it's not yeah and so they went okay well, this this plus is what's the common factor and they found, actually, in a number of these classes, the common factor was a um, an information um, roadshow. Mm. So some guy had gotten together and was going from town to town warning of the dangers of EM hypersensitivity. Mm, yeah, yeah, Lo yeah. and behold, shortly after this roadshow passed through warning of the dangers, a hotspot cluster would occur. Hotspot, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And so, but they went, okay, that's that's fine, but maybe it's true. Mm. So let's test this. So what we'll do is we'll get a box, and one of them, and it'll, it'll be a a, um, a router. Yeah. And it'll have all the electronics in it, and it will turn it on, mm -hmm. and it'll just be a normal one. And then we'll get one of those boxes that looks exactly the same with nothing in it. Yep, yep, yep. But a little flashing red light that looks exactly the same flashing red light as the other one. Then we'll get one that has all the electronics and it's turned on but we just take the lights out so you can't yeah, see that it's on and then we'll get one that's all empty with nothing in it at all like a control like yep and yeah they found that the people who claimed hypersensitivity were uh, had their symptoms come and go at a dose uh, what is it called a dose relative level based on the flashing red light yeah right so when they saw a flashing red light on the modem they would start feeling ill. Mm. Yep, yep, yep. Regardless of whether that was literally an empty box, and the modem which was turned on and operating, mm. but wasn't flashing its light, so they didn't know it was turned on. There's no way of telling. Yeah. No symptoms. Mm. Turn the flashing red light on. Oh, I'm getting ill. So you go, okay, you That's don't have weird. electromagnetic hypersensitivity. You've got flashing red light sensitivity. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was an interesting point here uh, that they do have sensitivity but it's not to like because you do uh, you can measure the effects of any given electromagnetic frequency on objects mm. and the effect that a wi-fi and there are some electromagnetic frequencies which do have effects on people for sure yeah, yeah. Uh, uv radiation for example will burn you yeah um infrared will make you feel warm mm. uh, and so on mm-hmm but they can know that the these routers and things that they tested do not have interaction with humans. Like, yeah, right. Like you're just you're just not going to get sick or anything because you have a Wi-Fi router. Yep. But that doesn't mean you can't get sick if you believe you get sick from a Wi-Fi. Well, router. that's right. Yeah. The, um, well, that's kind of starts and, to and also go that Pavlov theory. You may not even consciously believe that you are affected, but mm. rather other people do it, and you catch their their affect, disease. You catch their <laughs> hypersensitivity you off do. them. You do. Uh, and so there are people who have moved to what they're calling you know, Wi-Fi dead spots. We, they're not really. They're just as bathed as much EM as everyone else. But you know, they mm. ostensibly have fewer you know, connections of, of Wi-Fi and so forth. Yeah. They've still got satellites beaming all sorts of crap on them, but don't worry about it. 
but they feel better. They 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 don't suffer the the problems. Mm-hmm. And we've also had similar problems with like say people who are convinced they've got uh, asthma. Yeah. Or rather convinced that when they go to uh, a particular location to live, they don't get asthma. Yeah. Because it's a healthy place to live for whatever reason. You know, it's the altitude, it's the sea air, it's the you know the farm fresh air or whatever it is. Yep. And um, there are some locations you can go to help some diseases. Absolutely. But what I'm saying here is it's it's actually something that can be spread. So you get these little communities of, say, people escaping... Body snatchers. Um, <laughs> escaping asthma conditions or, or uh, hay fever. Yeah. Little communities of people who are getting genuine relief from their symptoms, mm. even though there's no medical or scientific or rational reason beyond a psychological one that they do get ra- relief. So that's that- where there's this... Um, what do you call it? Uh, ethical question about the use of placebo, like the knee surgeon. Yeah, yeah. If he says he's going to do it and then he doesn't, but you still get benefit, you know, you can sort of say, well, that's ethical because, in fact, he's been less invasive. Yeah. Because knee surgery can cause damage and can of cause course. complications, yeah, yeah, which yeah. I'm sure is one of the reasons this knee surgeon, he'd evaluate someone and go, you know, uh, this probably doesn't totally need knee surgery, but let's mm. just go through with it. Yeah. Yeah. And, so th- there are some ethical questions there also about someone who says, oh, I've got uh, electromagnetic hypersensitivity. It, t- it may turn out they've got a brain tumor. Yeah. And they've misassociated it. They think it's that they're sitting next to this computer all day and they get headaches. Oh, it, it must be the EM radiation. And so rather than, you know, they, they, they say that and they get dismissed. No, yeah. <laughs> foolish. Now it turns out they go off somewhere else away from EM radiation and they die of brain cancer. But, you know, <laughs> so it's it's a really interesting, fascinating it is, thing it is. where it's easy to dismiss people as crazy, but they're not really. Yeah, and I mean, like, it is a funny sociological thing as humans that we, we do band together. Mm. And so, therefore, you know, like, people say those things and and you're seeing it with the COVID debate vaccine you're seeing it we've seen it before like flat earthers uh, a few years trump, ago pokemon go trump you know and like QAnon you and- you jump people jump in and they and then the social algorithms that we have on social media are, are not are, are aiding some of that stuff mm. but yeah it is bizarre isn't it like a, a rational person can kind of start thinking those things but I, 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 I think you're exactly... I think this science is right. Like the minute that people believe, you know, they might believe this little stick figure of Jesus can cure them. And it does. Yeah, I to mean, an extent. Obviously, to, it won't like, sew your leg back on. But no, to, like it wouldn't fix that knee reconstruction that the surgeon could, could do. You but could believe it's stopping you from getting sick. That's right. And, 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 it, and probably, it literally does. It probably like, does yeah, to an extent. Like, so it's a funny thing, isn't it? Like... Yeah, so whether it's like you know the go- the you know the oh the you know the special spiritual cheeses, yeah. <laughs> or you know Jesus or or in this context like a body snatcher de- debate, like yeah, we it's a funny thing with humans, isn't it? I mean, yeah, there's no easy answer. Then I don't think the science really has it. No, it's it's because it's also internal. Like yeah. psychology wants to be a science and it tries to do things, but you can't measure as. As a, yeah, and this movie, Body Snatchers, and so many other science fiction films all make this point: is you you can't measure that feeling. Of you can't measure humanness. feeling. No, no, you can't. You know, I am a human. Yeah. How can you measure? It? You know, we can do your DNA. The, the Body Snatchers, they look and talk exactly like humans. Yeah. But they're not, and yeah. you can tell. You can how can you tell? How you can't? You can't shine a. Like a, Wilma says, it's a, it's the way he looks at me. You can't use a detector or a, yeah. or a you know an X ray or a scanner or something and say, nah, it's not human. That's um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So and that and that's a, this lovely um, and it's kind of a, almost a, in science fiction, it's kind of almost a rebellion against science, which is sort of saying, you your scientific method as a way of understanding the universe has limits. Yeah. There's a point where you you move into you know, what's outside of our universe, for example? Hmm. The universe is expanding from the Big Bang. Oh, that's cool. So what are we expanding into? Yeah. So We cannot measure that. We cannot because yep, yep, yep. we can only measure what's inside of our universe. Yes. So there's all sorts of speculation. but And also, if it's not matter, like if it's not anything we 
can grasp or understand and it's it's incomprehensible that's right and there's a boundary there it's a very very valid point and i think that's what this film sciencey wise does question that idea of doubting each other doubt what is crazy and what is not crazy you what know science could be crazy to one person it changes over time as well as was well you know we won't go into that tonight but you know science evolves what we thought was right you know changes and so you know, it, it is one of those things, and I think that's what that's what this film is all about. That theme, the doc, he's, a, and he even says it like, "I'm a doctor. Listen to me. I'm a doctor. I'm not just a cray cray person. I'm a doctor." You know, like yeah. and he says that in the opening moments of the film, and even then, they don't believe him until the very last second it's of the impossible film. Impossible to have crazy doctors. No, like, it, and but but you know, like we don't, we just we rationalize things and we put it, and that's what science does, and 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 this film is suggesting something else, and at the same time. How do you identify a body snatcher person when they organically look the same? And and then therefore we actually doubt the people doubting the other person. So yeah, it's a brilliant point that you've been raising there. So look, that brings us to the end of the invasion of the body snatchers. What did you think about what we've talked about tonight? Do you agree, disagree? Well, you know, was there anything that we missed out on that you'd like us to focus on next time? Is there a film that you would like us to look at? So you can find us on uh, our website spacebrains.com.au we're on twitter we're on instagram we're on facebook all of those places let us know what you thought please and our next film sorry the dish aussie film it's about that's some a- chefs who battle to create the best taste no hang on that's master <laughs> best chef. tasting spaceship food that's that's <laughs> that's the heston blumenthal He's- that's right no this film's all about how australia scientists played a really important role in the NASA moon landing, right? And it's, it is science fiction because even though it was real events, they obviously didn't really know what people did or said. And no. it is made more entertaining, I'm sure, than what it really was. From memory, I haven't seen this film for about 20 years. From memory, it's got science in it. So uh, I'm putting it in the sci-fi element. It's about a radio telescope. So, until next time. Until next time. See ya. Bye. Bye.